Thank you. You can be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take an impromptu morning break here. We had a juror that needed a break for a moment, and we need to sort out the exhibits. So we'll go ahead and have a, I don't know if this will be our, we might take another recess a little later, but we'll take a quick recess now with those circumstances to follow up on the exhibits and also allow the juror to uh, be accommodated. So we'll be on a break. Thank you. Please be seated. We can have the jurors brought back. Clears. <laughs> Just. I do have it now. Thank you, Counselor. Council, there's not a 107B, is there? No. Okay. Just while we're waiting, Ms. Smith, on those exhibits, so we went through the list of what was admitted, a substantial list last week, and where there are any sub-exhibits on any of those numbers, that's where it's probably worth checking with the clerk. Yeah, um, the next one is 127A, um, and then there won't be sub-exhibits for any of the others. Okay. And you should have that courtesy copy up there. I do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right. Uh, Ms. Smith, you can continue with your examination. Um, and just to make sure that um, 107A is up on the witness stand, do you need him to identify or does the court have its copy? I have a copy. Okay, great. May I have 107A back, please? Uh, Sergeant, um, just I know you said earlier before the um, break, I'll get it focused and quit moving it on you. Okay. Um, what is this again, just so the record's clear for the jurors? So when I, when I wrote the warrant, uh, the, these were, uh, this was an attachment, if you will, to that original warrant of names, numbers, uh, email addresses and stuff, that, uh, things that we were able to associate with people who were involved uh, with Lori. Okay. Um, 
And um, and then you put this in, and it ended up as part of the Google records, and then they gave you a return on the records they have associated with all of this. Correct. Okay. There's some highlights on this sheet. Um, what, why are those highlighted? Um, well, partly because um, if you look on the right, Melanie Boudreau, Alex Cox, Lori Vallow with two, Tylee Ryan with uh, two different numbers, and uh, and then at the lower these uh, as as our investigation continued, there were some phones that we uh, continued to come up that somehow well not somehow but came in association with uh, other numbers and other email accounts. Um, so some of these, for lack of a better word, we attributed to uh, calling burner phones. Okay. What's a burner phone? Uh, well, it's a, it's a phone that you can go to, say, Walmart, Target, whatever, and you can, it's like a pay phone. You just pay as you go type phone, and it's sometimes uh, it's really limited in use. It's a, if you will, in, in drug work, it's a common phone that is used uh, by people distributing illegal drugs so they can't have their number changed or, or number tracked and so forth. So we call them burner or drop phones. Okay. And so mm. some of the numbers on this list that Google returned um, documents on were things that, you, you know, law enforcement calls a burner phone, but it had attributed to either Chad or Lori or Melanie Boudreau or Alex Cox. Yeah, a lot of times when people get when when people get these types of phones, they still will access, um, say, Google accounts or other things that. Um, so th these companies keep track, and if you use a device and you log on to, say, one of your common accounts or whatever, they'll associate all of it together, and so they can they kind of keep a web of everything so they can associate um, what you're using and connect it, whether it's a computer, a cell phone, a tablet, they'll connect it all. So each new device, regardless of what num phone number it is, if you log into your Google account or you log into your Outlook account, gets associated at Outlook or at Google, even though the phone number is different. Yes, it'll connect. Okay. And so this request that was served on, um, this was the Google list, one of the Google list, all these numbers were numbers that you requested and had associated with some of the people in involved in this case and got returns from and data from Google. That's correct. Now, on that list, there was, let me put that back up there, I changed my mind. Homer J. Maximus, whose email was that? So when we re received the return, as I before mentioned, usually you have to put a subscriber, your name or, or phone number, things that, a subs anyway, uh, Homer J. Maximus, um, when we got the return, came back to uh, Alex Cox. And um, did the, the return on the Homer J. Maximus account also include various types of data associated with Homer J. Maximus? Yes. Including location data? Yes. Including messaging data? Yes. Okay. Emails? Yes. Search history? Yes. Okay. And a lot of that data um, you shared with other agencies, including FBI analysts? Correct. And the CAST unit? The CAST unit, yes. What's CAST? What is that group? Uh, it's the acronym, I hope I get this right, Sailor Analysis Systems Team. Okay. They, their job is to drill down and look at the, this data as well. So they, they have specific, usually specific data that they're looking for locations. Okay. And you mentioned earlier doing the, a different warrant for specific location data on the property. Was it to aid that same team? Yes, it was. Okay. Now, um, did you also receive a return on the Lori for style at iCloud.com? 
Yes. Okay. And was that data not only reviewed by your team but other analysts for review? Yes. Okay. What about Lally Time Forever at Gmail? Uh, yes. Um, that one was also received and gone through. Okay. And um, you went through Lally Time Forever as well? I did. Okay. Um, and we, we can circle back to that in a minute. Did you also look at the chad uh, daybell at gmail com that was on that list? Yes. Okay. Um, did you get a chance to look at that chad daybell at gmail com, um, and was it associated with Chad Daybell involved in this situation? Yes, the username uh, associated with it was Chad Daybell. Okay. Um, did you have a chance to look at um, Chad Daybell's search history? Yes. Okay. Um, and why would you look at someone's search history? Well, to get clues on, um, like I said, um, we're looking for children, whether they were looking for hotels or plane reservations or anything that would help us try and locate these children. Okay. Um, your Honor, may I hand the witness or have the witness handed State's Exhibit 157, which is a thumb drive he prepared? Yes. Did you get a chance to look at that, Sergeant? I have. Okay. What is it? It's a USB thumb drive. Okay. What is on that thumb drive? Uh, that would be, um, in part, uh, some of Chad's from the Chad.Daybell search history. Okay. And um, did you prepare that and, and look at it before coming into court today? Yes. Okay. And is it a true and accurate of the Google search history portions for September 8th and 9th and surrounding dates for Chad Daybell search history associated with chad.daybell at google at gmail.com. Yes. Okay. Move for the admission for States Exhibit 157. Any objection? You may. <clears throat> Can you please pull out Exhibit 157 for me? You said it's a thumb drive? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And how, how is it that you identify that thumb drive as the thumb drive that uh, is uh, what, what it purports to be? Because prior to coming in here, I viewed this thumb drive. And what, what happened to the envelope in the thumb drive? What happened to the envelope in the thumb drive? Where, where did you, did you give it back to somebody? Yes. Who did you give it to? I gave it back to the prosecution. All right. And um, did you put your name on the thumb drive to make sure that was the same thumb drive that that was uh, that was given to you no I mean it's a white thumb drive right correct Are, how is it that you're positive that this is the white thumb drive that you had well the writing appears to be the same as on states exhibit 157 the writing appears to be the same the number 157 on the exhibit appears to be the same as what I looked at earlier you took specific notice of how the handwriting was on 157 when you when you looked at the thumb drive? Well, it appears to be the same. The same as what? The same lettering, the same numbers. 157? Correct. Okay. And that's how you're identifying that as being the specific thumb drive that you reviewed? That's correct. Okay. And you don't know if it's been altered or, or changed since the time that you viewed what you believe to be is uh, Exhibit 157? I haven't viewed it since I viewed it downstairs. All right. And I'm going to object based on the fact that I don't think that he has a personal knowledge of what is actually on this drive. May I ask a quick question, Your Honor? You may. You had previously prepared that for another proceeding, correct? Correct. And in that previous proceeding, it had a state's exhibit number 80 on it, didn't correct. it? 
Yep. Okay. Can you see the previous exhibit sticker sticking underneath of it? I can. And does that say Exhibit 80 on that as well? Yes. And the we just put a new exhibit sticker on top of it for this trial. That's right. Move for the admission of states Exhibit 157. All right. Well, on this exhibit, or I'm sorry, on this yeah particular exhibit, the thumb drive contains information which the detective has laid a foundation for uh, and through previously admitted other documents would be able to be uh, part of the evidence of the case. So I wouldn't sustain an objection there. Because of the objection raised, I'll provisionally admit the exhibit and then I'll just instruct the witness that if what you're sh being shown differs in any way from the data that you believe would be on this disk or thumb drive, in other words, if it's not the same data he thinks on that disk, then you're advised to notify the court or counsel that we don't have the correct thumb drive. Other than that, really the evidence is what's contained in the digital file on the drive. So I'll allow for the witness to be able to view the, th the file that's on the drive. And uh, if it's not what you think it is, then advise the court or counsel. So with that, the objections overruled. Um, Sergeant, you looked at that, you double checked it this morning, right? I did. Okay. And it's part of the Google records that have previously been admitted in States Exhibit 107? Yes. All right. So um, just to talk to us about it, um, did you look at Chad Daybell's search history um, um, for the date of September 8th of 2019? Yes, I did. Why'd you do that? Well, it was, uh, uh, it was around the time that the, uh, at least, Tylee Ryan had gone missing. And so we were looking uh, around those specific dates to see if we could find any clues as to help us locate the children. Okay. And what did you find when you looked at his search history? Uh, one thing that I found was um, that on the 8th, in the afternoon hours, um, the user of this account, um, the owner of the account was Chad Daybell. The user of this account um, looked up um, what the wind direction was going to be for the next day. And the next day would be September 9th of 2019? That's correct. Okay. Um, did that have any significance to you as an investigator? It did because of uh, other things that I had learned um, and that uh, that is the day that uh, Chad Daybell had said he was going to uh, burn limbs and kill the raccoon okay. in his yard. Okay. And he did a wind search on September 8th. That's right. And the wind search uh, reflected the wind was going to be south-southwest. Now, let's talk about the search warrant you did on um, January 15th for the Verizon numbers accounts for um, uh, that you received for Lori and, and Charles Vallow. Um, let me up on your witness stand. I think we did that at the break. Is States Exhibit 127A. Do you recognize that? I do. What is it? This would be uh, the bill that was taken from the uh, P.O. box in Sugar City uh, containing um, various numbers, um, mostly all uh, family members of the Vallow and Cox family. Okay. Um, and that exhibit was attached to your um, the, the subpoena you served on Verizon? Yes. Or the grand jury search warrant you returned on the search warrant you returned on Verizon? Yes, it was an attachment. Okay. And then it came back with their records? Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to display States Exhibit 127A, which has been admitted as part of 127, Your Honor. All right. Before we do that, Ms. Smith, have we have you moved on from Exhibit 157? Yes, at okay. this point. Yes. As I, as I understand, the 
the objection that was made in my ruling was dependent on him confirming, on your witness confirming that the file was the same. So I still haven't admitted 157 pending an observation by the witness that, in fact, the file is correct based on the objection raised. And I took that from the court that we would have him look at that at the break. I didn't think you wanted him to do it in the courtroom. We certainly can because he's got to plug it into a laptop. And so I assumed that would happen at a break. I can certainly have him stop and do it now if you'd like. With your laptop there, is he able to just view and confirm that, in fact, the file is correct? Sure. Why don't we just take a moment, if you can do that, and I'll allow you to approach with your laptop. Thank you. May I approach as well, Judge? You may. Yes, Mr. Thomas. I'll just watch you if you want to. Well, it just usually comes up on there. Oh, okay. I'll put it on the record in a second. Well, in lieu of a sidebar, let's go ahead and go back on the record, and you can lodge your objection if there is one, Mr. Thomas. Okay, we're going to go back on the record. We had a quick, not a sidebar there, but I allowed the prosecution to show the file to the witness who's on the stand, Detective Stubbs, on Exhibit 157, and allowed Counsel Mr. Thomas to view that as well to confirm what is on the jump drive before the jump drive is admitted into evidence. So, Mr. Thomas, were you able to view the contents of that jump drive briefly? I was, Your Honor. Do you have any furthering objection? I do, Your Honor. What's the objection? Your Honor, I believe the court was requesting that we put one file per jump drive so that when the jury gets the jump drives, there's only one file to look at. It looks like there are a number of 
envelopes or a number of uh, folders inside that file. All right. Um, Madam Prosecutor, what's your response there? It, it is the it is n the court's request that was that we not have multiple records from multiple agencies on um, one jump drive. This is the Google search history associated with and the records associated with the chad.daybell at gmail.com. And that was the return for that information, including the search history. If the state or the witness were to start sort of taking apart that particular email account, we would have a real completeness issue. Um, it is not the entirety of the Google return for the 18 or 20 emails they did in the multiple phone numbers. It's all of the chad.daybell at gmail.com information and the certificate of service from Google and the account record to show user information. So this is a slightly different um, than what um, uh, the court had ruled. And to kind of tear apart that, I, I would worry about an appellate record down the road. It's specific to that email, and it's the state's information is specific to um, and requests is specific to the search history. Okay, and before I allow any response from Mr. Thomas, I'll just indicate. So the, I didn't necessarily have a, a ruling on exhibits. I did want to have noted in the record before electronic storage devices like jump drives are just given to the jury precisely what's on there since they will have an opportunity to open those up and we need to fully disclose the contents of any of those drives. So uh, it's not necessarily a rule that one file per drive on some of those video files and other things right. that makes sense. Here, if there's an explanation to tie them together, um, I think in order, obviously, to offer the exhibit, knowing that it will go in to the jury and they need to know, or we defense needs to know what's what all is on there before they get it, um, then on this one and in future offerings of exhibits that have those electronic files, I would need you to identify precisely what's contained on the jump drive, just so that uh, in the, the record's clear for the defense to also see what's being proffered. So with that in mind, the other files that are on there, um, I believe you've now identified those, and were those all previously disclosed through uh, to the defense in in the discovery process. Yes, Judge. They've been given in, in multiple forms, both when the large Google account was turned over, also when the exhibits from prior hearings, it's Exhibit 80 from a previous event, um, um, and that specific thumb drive, that is the state's copy of the thumb drive that was used at a previous um, hearing, and the defense got copies of all of those exhibits. All right. Well, Close to two years ago. With that, then, uh, Mr. Thomas, any further response on your objection on Exhibit 157? Your Honor, if the court's satisfied that the jury is going to get the appropriate uh, information, then I'm satisfied as well. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So uh, with that, then, Exhibit 157 is admitted. And then, again, if we have uh, data stored on these drives, Ms. Smith or any of the other prosecutors, please just make sure we identify what's on those drives as they get offered. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, and just as a quick clarification, um, the state had asked the witness that it's the information associated with the chad.gmail.com. You want more detail than that. I just want to make sure we do it the way you want. I just want to know what files are on there so that um, we don't think there's just a single file and then the jurors open a jump drive and there's multiple files that maybe the defense was not aware were being admitted. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. So moving on to State's Exhibit um, 127, um, the Verizon account. Have you had a chance to look at State's Exhibit 127A? I have. Okay. And are, is that a, a true and accurate listing of the um, items that you had sent to Verizon, including phone numbers that you requested records for? Yes. Okay. Permission to display State's Exhibit 127A, Your Honor? Any objection? 
No objection, Judge. All right, Exhibit 127A can be published. Okay. Sergeant, there are multiple records on this. Do you see any accounts or items associated with Lori Vallow? Yes, I do. Okay. And the various numbers that are included in this one include multiple phone numbers for Lori Vallow, correct? Correct. And multiple phone numbers for who else? There were multiple phone numbers for Charles Vallow as well. Okay. And when we received the return on those search warrants, did we receive the information and data associated with those phone numbers? Yes. And was that information and data associated with all those phone numbers in States Exhibit 127A also supplied to other investigators for analysis? Yes, that is correct. Now, earlier you mentioned that on your review of the Google search warrant that you had looked at the Lolly Time Forever at Gmail account. Do you recall seeing that? Yes, I do. Okay. Now, is this one of the accounts that you specifically personally looked at? Yes. Okay. Did you find anything of note in this investigation? Yes. In reviewing the Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com, this email address was associated with Lori Vallow. Did you look at her search history? Yes. Did you see anything of note around August 25th of 2019? August 5th? 25th. 25th, yes. I thought you said 5th, sorry. August 25th, 2019, the user of this account looked for Malachite wedding rings, wedding rings made of Malachite. Also went to a website where the user of this account ordered an 11.5 size ring and a 4.25 Malachite ring for, I think the total was $808 and some change. Now, why did this catch your attention? Well, it caught my attention. Number one, Charles had died in July. We had information that Chad and Lori were seeing each other, but yet Chad was still married to his wife, Tammy, at that time. So we were thinking it was kind of odd for them to be looking, or for her to be looking at wedding rings at that time. And I may have missed it, so forgive me. Did the warrant return any names as the account owner or the account holder? Yes, the account holder was Lori Vallow. Okay. And so you saw that search. Did you see any searches in that search history associated with Lori Vallow at the beginning of September that were of interest to you? So there were two searches that got my attention in September. The first would have been on the 20th, where the user of the account looked up the definition of possessed. Okay. And you said there were two. What was the other search? The other one would have been on the 30th, where the user of the account searched for how to remove the rear seat of my Jeep Wrangler, and then that person accessed a YouTube video to watch how to remove the seat of 
the said Jeep. Okay. And that was on, you said September 30th of 2019? Yes. Why did that catch your attention? That caught my attention because of the uh, attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreau uh, a couple days later. Um, did you find any searches in October of interest? Uh, yes. Um, October 22nd, the user of this account looked for wedding dresses in Kauai, Hawaii. Why did this catch your attention? Uh, due to the fact that we knew um, Chad and Lori had been involved at this point, uh, what also caught my attention was this was being looked at at the same day um, Tammy's funeral was. Did you see anything in the search history from November that caught your attention? Um, I'm not sure on this particular. Okay. Um, did you look at any um, of the account history and search information related to any potential travel plans? Um, well, there were multiple travel plans. Um, were, there, were there any specific travel t plans that caught your attention? Um, travel to and from Hawaii, okay. um, different airlines. Okay. Um, any other um, travel within the United States that caught your attention? On November 5th. What was that? Um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank on that one. That's okay. Um, uh, were there searches for any travel at or near on uh, October 9th, 2019? Um, October 9th, uh, yes. What was that? Uh, travel to... Um, Believe Illinois. Okay. Um, why was October 9th of interest to you? Uh, it was the day that um, Tammy was reported shot at at her residence. Okay. And um, the travel was the. Tr did you have any information that in October of 2019, Lori and Melanie Boudreaux and others traveled? to anywhere? Yes. Where did they go? Uh, Illinois. Okay. Um, what city? Do you remember? Uh, I should I should remember this. Um, I know they were visiting uh, LDS church sites out there. Okay. Uh, Adma diamonds, things like that. And 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 what did you call it? I'm sorry. It was called Adam on Diamond. Okay. And is that in Missouri or is that in Illinois? Sorry, that's in Missouri. Okay. Yeah, she's she's leading the witness. Obviously, he 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 wasn't. She wasn't in Illinois. She's now telling him where he, where she was. This is leading. It's so super inappropriate. It's leading. Judge, I'm going to object to any speaking objections. Well, that's mm -hmm. true. It is a speaking objection also. So, Counselor, just move on without the leading questions. Please. Okay. Thank you. So, I'm sorry. What, Adam? I, I'm sorry. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not LTS. So, what what was it? It was called Adam on Diamond, and apparently it is affiliated with the LDS Church as uh, some kind of historical site. Okay. And where is that? Uh, that is in Missouri. Okay. And is did do you have information that um, Lori Vallow went there? Yes. Do you remember what date Lori Vallow went there? Well, she was, I believe, I know she was there on the 9th. Okay. All right. Let's move. Now, um, did you also um, uh, turn over the location data records for both 
Chad, Daybell, Lori, Vallow, and Alex Cox to the cast unit. Are we referring to these particular dates or? No, any dates. Okay, yes, all, uh, all of the returns that I had were given to the cast unit. Okay, so other than the electronic and data search warrants um, you did, did you participate in any other interviews or ev evidence gathering in this case? Could you re maybe reformulate that question? Sure. Other than the electronic and data searches and search warrants you did, did you participate or um, did you do any other interviews or ev evidence gathering in this case? Yes. Okay. Um, in December of 2019, did you go to Springville, Utah? Yes. Okay. Who did you speak with there? Um, I spoke with uh, uh, Tammy's parents and sister and brother-in-law. Why did you guys go there and speak to them? Well, again, uh, this was fairly early on in the, in the investigation, and uh, we were just still looking for clues of where these uh, where these kids were. And so we were just trying to exhaust every avenue, anyone who would have any knowledge of, of the kids. Okay. And in January of 2020, did you participate in gathering any evidence related to hotels or motels? Yes. Okay. Um, and did you gather information related to Hampton Inn, um, uh, Hampton Inns? Yes. Did, and those have previously been admitted as business records. Um, and were you able to get records from Hamptons Inn? Yes. Okay. Did you get information from any Motel 6s? Yes, uh, Motel 6 in both Rexburg and Rigby. Okay. And what did those records show? Uh, it showed um, various stays um, in... Um, September and October. Okay. Um, okay. In, I'm sorry, in Rigby and where? Rexburg. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, were you also able to obtain an, um, uh, any copies of Lori Vallow's wedding to Chad Daybell? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be ha handed States Exhibit 61. A through 61G. Actually, there should be. I'm sorry, through 61H. Here you go. Do you need the state to approach? No, we have courtesy copies up through F, but we don't have G and H. Okay, we'll make sure you have them, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. I just want to make sure you had them. Um, uh, Sergeant Stubbs, what are these? Uh, these are pictures, uh, if you will, hard copy pictures of 
digital pictures taken off of a PNY uh, USB flash drive. Okay. And um, these are specific pictures of what? Uh, Hawaii, the wedding of Lori and Chad. Okay. Um, and um, do you know the date of that ceremony? Yes. What was the date of that ceremony? November 5th, 2019. Okay. And um, states exhibit 61... A through 61H, are each of those images true and accurate copies of the images of that wedding you found on a hard drive? Yes, I made these copies. Yes. Um, move for the admission of states exhibit 61A to 61H and request permission to publish. Any objection? May I have one there? You may. All right. So it looks like uh, 61A <coughs> and H, A through H, are photographs of Lori and Chad. Is that correct? A through H? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And how is it that you came in contact with these photographs? So these photographs were found on a flash drive that was seized um, at the time uh, Lori and Chad were uh, talk to in Hawaii from their vehicle. So it was seized from their vehicle? Correct. Okay. And you were there when they, when they were seized? I was not. Okay. Um, how did you come into contact with these? Uh, the digital evidence was uh, packaged, chain of custody, and then uh, returned to us in Rexburg at that time uh, a warrant was written for the devices. Okay. And where where is this chain of custody? Is it part of the, it's not part of these exhibits, right? No. Okay. So you just you're you're all object that well, you know what, I'm not I'm not gonna object. Okay. Uh, then exhibit 61A through H yes, Judge. are admitted, and they may be published if you'd like. Okay, let's make a record. What is... What do we see in 61A? Uh, this would be Chad and Lori, uh, November 5th, 2019, uh, on the beach in Hawaii at their wedding ceremony. Okay. If I may just add, so I don't have to do it on each one, yeah. each of these photos was taken with a Canon EOS Mark III camera. And how do you know that? Because this is a digital, this is, this is a digital picture. Um, all of our phones, all digital cameras and everything nowadays have uh, what's called XF data that is associated. XF, EXIF data and what it is, it leaves a digital footprint um, on each of these photos. If you look at the details of the photo when you're looking at it with, say, a computer or forensic software, you'll be able to see date, time, uh, what kind of camera took it, so forth and so on. A lot of times it'll even give you GPS coordinates and so forth and so on. So on the images and that you saw the camera data associated with each of these on the device that you had a search warrant for. That's correct. Okay. What is 61B? Uh, this would appear to be Chad and Lori um, in Hawaii again. Um, what I believe is standing in front of the uh, Mormon LDS temple. Sixty one C. 
again, another picture at their wedding ceremony um, on the beach in Hawaii. Sixty one D. This would be a picture of um, Chad and Lori's hands. Um, they're both displaying uh, wedding rings. It appears wedding rings uh, made of uh, or containing malachite stone. Why do you say that? Because uh, my earlier testimony where she um, in August was looking up wedding rings made of malachite. And malachite's a green stone? Correct. Sixty, 61E. Again, another wedding photo on the beach of the two of them in okay. Hawaii. And in this picture, can you see um, their hands together and see mm -hmm. one of their wedding rings? Yes. Also, you could see that same ring in C as well. Okay. This is just a different view. Of a different view, yes. Okay. 61F. A uh, picture of their wedding ceremony along with the uh, preacher who conducted the ceremony. Sixty-one G. Uh, appears uh, sometime during the ceremony. Um, their Lori and Chad's celebration of their marriage. Okay. And sixty-one H. Again, uh, another photo. Uh, sometime during their wedding ceremony of the two of them uh, kissing on the beach. 2010 when I started specifically going into computers. Okay, and that's when you started doing work as a detective in the, uh, I mean, Rexburg isn't a huge city, so how much of this uh, 
particular type of work is uh, is your detective work as far as what you do in Rexburg? So, correct me if I'm wrong. You're asking what percentage is devoted to this kind of work? Is that what you're Probably saying? Probably a bad question. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm getting at. So I would say. Um, Probably about 50% of my work is dedicated to this, if not slightly more. Oh, okay. Um, and so I'm sure probably about 50% of your training is to get dedicated to this type of work? At least. Okay. Um, and so let's just talk about in the last, say, year, what kind of training have you done as far as forensics goes? Um, taken a couple smaller online courses, um, some brief updates on software uh, additions. Which ones? Uh, would be Celebrite. Is that the only one? Uh, that's the only one within the last year that I've done updates with. Have you had prior training on Celebrite? Yes. Okay. When was that? Um, I don't remember exact date when I started using Celebrite, but I have used it and done updates and certifications for several years. What types of certifications do you have in the forensic, uh, um, cellular, forensic, electronic type, type of... Uh, realm here? Uh, I've had, well, Celebrite, uh, certify, certified Celebrite operator, uh, CCO, Celebrite certified physical analysts. Uh, I've had trainings and certifications in access data, magnet forensics, What's magnet forensics? It's a computer, cell phone, uh, software, if you will. So, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of what you do is you take devices and you pull off information from a particular person's life from that from that device. Is that right? Restate that, please. When you when you take a device that you've gotten from a search warrant or whatever, you're looking for life information, information about that person's life, right? Well, every all information that the device would store. Okay. But when you're looking at specific, okay, I'll just, I'll move on. Um, and so these electronic devices that you looked at in this specific case, uh, there were a number of them, right? About 100, almost 100? I don't recall the exact number, um, but as I said earlier, a lot of these devices, the, uh, the data was obtained through warrants and so forth, was split up amongst different people to analyze, if you will. Mm -hmm. and this is a massive amount of data, right? Yes. Okay. So you weren't able to analyze all of the data yourself? That's correct. Okay. You specifically indicated that um, on the return of search warrant 2020-76 and 2020-77. Those are geofences of uh, Chad Daybell's home and Lori Vallow's home, is that right? Correct, yes. And in all of that data, did you, the only person, I believe what you said was, the only person that you found uh, that had been to both Chad Daybell's home and Lori Vallow's home on September 22nd or 23rd or September 8th or September 9th was Alex Cox. Yeah, the only one that we could see that shared all those locations, those dates, times. Okay. So you couldn't tie Lori Vallow to those locations at, the, at those times? Correct. Okay.
You mentioned some burner phones, um, and you said that those are phones that uh, drug dealers use. You didn't think that Chad or Lori were using drugs, did you? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. They weren't drug dealers to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Okay. So burner phones aren't just for drug dealers, they're for just regular people that that either can't afford a, a phone plan or there are several reasons for people buying burner phones, right? Uh, there could be, yes. All right. Uh, Exhibit 157, we talked a little bit about that, about that being a USB thumb drive that had the uh, the Google searches on it. Is that right? Search history? Uh, the search history for who are we talking about? Well, you tell me. You, you're the one that said adamantly that you knew what 157 was. Okay. Tell um, me about 157. Do you want to show me 157 again, please? Sorry. Okay. Does that refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. So tell me a little bit about 157. What's on there? That's the search. Uh, that would be the Google data from Chad Daybell. And this includes the uh, search history? Yes. And you indicated that there was some significance to a search history about uh, some, what was the wind direction going to be the next day or whatever? Correct. Okay. And you work in Rexburg. You indicated that you've worked there for quite a number of years? Yes. Okay. During the seasons, the wind usually moves in one direction, right? North or south, usually, yeah. Okay. All right. So why was it this specific day, this specific search, so unusual to you? Because the user of the account was looking for the wind direction for the ninth. At no other time did I see the user of this account inquire about the wind direction at any other time. But anything that you gather from that would be speculative, right? I mean, you're just speculating as to why he might be looking for this. Sure. Okay. Do you know what size ring uh, Lori Vallow is? I, I don't. Okay. You, you made some issue about the search history on August the 25th about uh, the user was looking for wedding rings or Malachite wedding rings. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And um, there were specific sizes that they were looking at. Is that right or am I wrong? Looked for a size 4.25 and an 11.5. Okay. And you don't happen to know what size ring Chad Daybell wears? I, I do not. And you don't know, happen to know what size ring Alex Cox wears? I do not. And you don't happen to know what size ring Zulema Pastinez wears? No. I have no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Does the state have any redirect examination? Very briefly, Your Honor. Very well. Okay. 
Um, Defense Counsel asked you about your training and your experience in Rexburg. Are you also part of regional efforts on addressing uh, crimes associated with the Internet? Yes, uh, I am part of the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force for the state of Idaho. Okay. I work closely with uh, the Attorney General's Office here uh, in those matters, and um, also I work uh, closely with the Department of Homeland Security in these uh, type of investigations. Um, so uh, in your work as part of these task force, you do some of the record collection analysis and review for multiple agencies? Yes, I do analysis for uh, a lot of our surrounding counties and uh, others that would pertain to the task force. Okay. And um, Defense Counsel asked you about burner phones. Um, are they commonly used in situations where people are trying to hide their involvement in criminal behavior? Uh, yes. Are they commonly used in situations where people are try, trying to hide their connection or relationship uh, to people from other people in their lives? In my experience, yes. And um, in the... Um, search history accounts where you saw a search history for Malachite and Malachite wedding rings. Do you remember that search history defense counsel asked you about? Yes. Okay. That was associated with the Lori for style at Gmail account, correct? Lolly time forever. Lolly time forever at Gmail. Correct. And the owner at Google of that account was who? Lori Vallow. Now, in the area surrounding Chad Daybell's property, um, if you know, um, what is, um, it, it, are there neighbors north of Chad Daybell's property? Uh, the neighbors that would be to the north of the property would be, in an estimate, would be at least a uh, quarter mile away. Okay. And so it, the, would, would people to the north be the recipient if the wind is blowing from the south or southwest? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Yes. May I recross just one question? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so you indicated that you had reviewed some, some uh, data from Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com and a whole bunch of others. In any of that review of any of those, any of that data, did you ever see anything from Lori saying, let's kill the kids? No. Did you ever see anything that said, will you kill my kids? No. Anything that said, let's kill the kids? No. Anything remotely akin to any of that? Object has been asked and answered. Overruled. Anything akin to any of that? For this account, no. Any of the accounts? I wouldn't know on some of the other accounts because I didn't review those. Okay, but you were part of the team that reviewed them, right? Right. Judge, I'm, I'm going to object, ask and answer, and other officers are going to be in testifying as to the findings on those other accounts. I'll overrule the objection. So based on anything that you've seen, is there anything in there where Lori had texted or emailed or uh, any type of data that says anything about wanting to kill her children? No. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. That will conclude the examination then of Detective Stubbs. Yes, Your Honor. just briefly inquire of the jurors with our morning break. Um, I'm inclined to maybe go a while longer and maybe see if we can take lunch a little earlier than normal. Is that possible? Okay. Are, are you all okay to keep going for another hour? Okay. Very well. We'll keep going on then. If the state's got another witness to call after Detective Stubbs, you can go ahead and step down. Is Detective Stubbs going to be recalled in the case? 
Will the detective be recalled in the case or can um, he be excused? He may be. Um, I don't think so, but to be safe, we ought to not excuse him. Okay. Uh, Detective Stubbs, then, I don't know if you're here under subpoena. If you are, then you continue to uh, need to comply with the subpoena until you're directed that you're excused in the case. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. All right, if the state wants to call its next witness. The state will call Nicole Heideman. Okay. All right, Ms. Heidemann, now that you've been sworn, let me just inquire, have you reviewed any of the trial testimony in this case since it started? I have not. Okay, you haven't watched any of the coverage of the case or reviewed online or on news or anything, any of the prior testimony? No. Okay, thank you for that response. Uh, as we get started then, please make verbal responses to all questions and try to avoid talking at the same time as any lawyer asking you a question so we can keep our record clear. With that in mind then, Ms. Blake, you can inquire on direct. Thank you, Your Honor. Will you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Nicole Heideman, H-E-I-D-E-M-A-N. Where are you currently employed? The Federal Bureau of Investigation. How long have you been employed with them? Uh, almost 15 years. What is your current title or position? I am a tactical specialist. Have you held other positions within the FBI? I have. And what are those? I was an evidence technician prior to my current position. At some point, did you become involved in an investigation regarding some missing children? I did. And who were those missing children? Uh, J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan. As part of your job duties, were you given specific assignments with regard to that investigation? I was. At some point, did that investigation broaden to include some other uh, investigation to other conduct? Yes. And what other conduct? Um, there was the investigation into the murder of uh, Charles Vallow, as well as Tammy Dayball, and an attempted shooting or a shooting of Brandon Boudreaux. As part of your job duties, were you asked to review some Google searches on chad.daybell at gmail.com? I was. Were you also asked to look into some Google searches conducted on lollytimeforever at gmail.com? Your Honor, I'm going to ask that defense, the witness, and the court all be handed a copy of State's Exhibit 184A. I will note we have not brought in 184 yet. That will come in later. Um, with regard to this, it, this is a printout of another exhibit that's a PowerPoint, but it's a printout for the benefit of counsel, the court, and the witness. Okay. And if you'll look those pages over. And do you recognize those? I do. And were those, in fact, created by you? Yes. And are they printouts from a PowerPoint that you created? Yes. Did you create that based on your investigation or what you reviewed in this case? It was. Does that, would that aid in your testimony today? Yes. And is that a summary of what you reviewed? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of State's Exhibit 184A. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. May I voir dire and aid of an objection? Yes. So these summaries of activities, uh, this isn't a full summary, correct? Uh, no. Well, it's not all the searches, no. 
I mean, there's only eight eight searches on the Chad Daybell one and nine searches on the Lori Daybell one. Yeah, it's, it's not all the activity, just a summary of um, relevant search findings. When you say a summary of relevant for search findings, those, that's just a summary of the things that go towards your theory of the case, right? Uh, towards what, uh, yeah, law enforcement theory of the case. Okay. Well, there's a whole bunch of other searches that were done between January of 2019 and October of 2019, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We won't object for the purposes of of, uh, of what she's testifying to today, Judge. Okay, so Exhibit 184A is admitted. And, Your Honor, I would ask to be able to publish Exhibit 184A to the jury. You may publish it. Thank you, Your Honor. And it is going to be from the laptop. Okay. <clears throat> As I indicated, this is actually a PowerPoint. I have a jump drive that has been marked with States Exhibit 184A for admission to the court uh, after being published. Okay. And it, uh, well, to be clear, then 184A, it, there's a paper version of it. You've also got the jump drive. Correct. Are they both going to be labeled 184A? Yes, that's what we've been doing before. I think uh, what the court's indicated before is the jump drive will be the actual exhibit because it contains the PowerPoint, but for courtesy of the court and counsel, we did the printouts. Understood. So 184A is admitted, and you can publish the PowerPoint if you want. Okay. And Ms. Heideman, looking at this first slide, um, it indicates October 1st, 2018 through the end of production. Were there additional searches contained prior to October 1st, 2018? Yes. Why did you focus in on October 1st of 2018 forward? Our investigation revealed that uh, Chad Dable and Lori Vello met in October of 2018, uh, specifically October 26, 2018, so uh, we chose just to go a little bit prior to that for investigative purposes. And I would ask again the witness, sorry, if you can just really talk right into the microphone. They're not all that <laughs> sensitive and that'll make right. sure it's on the record. So looking at the first search indicated there, will you read the date and the search into the record? January 28th, 2019. Ned Snyder, 1996, Duff, Louisiana. Ned Snyder, Louisiana. Ned Snyder, Louisiana, born 1951, died in 1996, and bodies possessed after original occupant dies. And you were asked by defense counsel, there were additional searches on here, uh, correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. Why did this particular search stick out? Uh, in the Chandler investigation, Chandler PD investigation, uh, Charles Vallow had made reference that he was being referred to as Ned Snyder or Schneider. Do you know where Charles was originally from? Uh, Louisiana, I believe. And then the next search on there, if you could read the date and that search into the record. January 31st, 2019, Ned Schneider, Louisiana, obituary, 1997. And did that one stick out for the same reasons? It did. And then the next one, if you could read the date and the search into the record. March 6, 2019, June 26, star sign, are Cancer and Leo compatible? And May 4th, star sign, uh, Taurus and Leo compatible. What was it? Jack, that is not what what's said on there. She's reading into what the exhibit actually says. And, Your Honor, I think I'm aware of what counsel is indicating, if I may just ask a clarifying question. Go ahead. Um, I think what counsel's referencing is on the... Uh, May 4 sign. May 4 sign? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, could you just read that part uh, starting with the May? Yeah, my apologies. May 4 sign, Taurus and Leo compatible. Counsel, does that take care of the objection? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Why did that specific search stick out? Uh, June 26th is uh, Lori Vallow's birthday. Uh, May 4th is Tammy Daybell's birthday. And uh, Chad Daybell's birthday is August 11th, making him a Leo. And then if you can read the date of the next search and the search into the record. May 5th, 2019, 
Malachite, eBay Malachite Jewelry. And what was it about that search that stuck out? Uh, Malachite is a green stone that Chad and Lori ultimately purchased for their wedding bands. And the next one, if you could read the date and the search. June 1st, 2019, Hiplos. And what was it about that one that caught your attention? Uh, Hiplos was another name that we found in the investigation to refer to uh, Charles Vallow. And the next one, if you could read the date and the search. Uh, July 9th, 2019, when you surprise someone with accusations. What was it about that particular search that caught your attention? Uh, that search was two days prior to Charles Vallow's uh, murder. And the next one, if you could read the date in the search. September 8th, 2019. SSW wind, what is the definition of SSW direction? What about that stood out? Uh, that date is the day prior to, or the day of that we believe um, Tylee Ryan was murdered and uh, we believe she was buried on the property or burned and buried on the property on September 9th, 2019. So it would have been the day prior. And whose property? Chad Daybell's. Do you recall when you were looking at the search terms, did you notice if Chad Daybell generally or commonly searched wind direction? No, not, I don't believe he, other than this occurrence, I don't believe he did. And if you could read the date of the next one and the search term. October 8th, 2019, Rhode Island area code. What was it about that that stood out? Um, Chad Daybell, there's multiple phones involved in this investigation. Uh, one of them is a 401 area code, which is the which is the uh, area code for Rhode Island. It also is the same date that that 401 phone number went active, was activated. And then looking at the next slide here, um, this is linked to the Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com account. This has specific dates listed on there, the March 7th, 2019 to December 14th, 2019. Why are, is that indicative of the, the dates that these searches occurred? Why did we choose those dates? Yes. I believe that was the date of the search warrants. Okay. Or I, I would have to double check that one. But those were the parameters of the dates that you were looking and retrieving this information, is that correct? Correct. Um, looking at the first one, if you could read the date into the record and the search term. May 7th, 2019, Malachite. What caught your attention about that search? Uh, similarly to Chad's um, search, it was the same green stone that was ultimately uh, purchased for the wedding bands. And the next one, if you could read the date and then the search term. July 21st, 2019. Gerber Life Policy, Life Insurance for Children, the Grow Up Plan. What caught your attention about that search? Uh, at the time of this, that this, that we reviewed this and subsequently finding out that the children had died, we thought it was of interest that uh, Lori was searching for life insurance for children. And to be clear, were any life insurance policies ever discovered for the children? Not that I'm aware of. Could you read the date of the next one as well as the content into the record? July 26, 2019, Phoenix Pet Services, Craigslist, Cell Service Dog, Little Angel Service Dogs, Service Dogs for Sale, and Offer Up Phoenix. What about that caught your attention? Uh, JJ Vallow had a service dog, um, and after Charles' death, they sold the dog, so it's uh, looking for how to sell or rehome a service dog. And JJ was still alive on July 26th of 2019, is that correct? That's correct. What about the next one? Could you read the date and the search term into the record? August 25th, 2019, wedding bands made of malachite. And I think you may have answered this already, but what about that caught your attention? Uh, again, Malachite is a recurring theme. Uh, on, on the initial May 7th Malachite search, Charles Vallow is still alive, and um, he's deceased at this point, but Tammy Daybell is still alive. And then if you could read the date of the next one and the content into the record. 
September 20th, 2019, Kennedy Elementary, Rexburg, Idaho, phone number and defined possessed. So it looks like there's two. I'm going to object again. She misstated what she said Devon possessed, and it was just possessed. That's, it, it's sustained. It was misread. Very good. He'll just correct it. Um, just looking at the second search there, could you read that into the record? Define possess. And look, it appears that there's two separate uh, terms there, two separate searches. What about the one regarding Kennedy Elementary caught your attention? That was the school J.J. Vallow attended in Rexburg, Idaho. And what about the second uh, search there caught your attention? Uh, for similar reasons, but this uh, search occurred just a day or two after we believe uh, J.J. died. And that's referring to the September 24th search? Correct. Um, looking at the September 20th, there's also the defined possess. Was there something about that that caught your attention? Uh, throughout the investigation, the concept of possession, demons, uh, those sort of um, ideas came up pretty frequently. So in context within the same time frame as uh, the Kennedy Elementary School, we thought that was of interest. And the two dates there on the Kennedy Elementary School are September 20th and September 24th, correct? Correct. Do you know when the last time JJ was seen was? Uh, the last proof of life was the morning of September 22nd, 2019. So right in between those two dates. Correct. And if you would look at the uh, next one on there, the one on September 30th, if you could read the date into the record and the search. September 30th, 2019, how to get the back seat out of my Jeep Wrangler, Jeep Wrangler JK rear seat removal, how to DIY YouTube. What stood out about that search? <clears throat> Uh, the date of the search, September 30th, was uh, just a few days before um, Brandon Boudreau was shot in Arizona uh, from a Jeep Wrangler. And when you say shot, do you mean shot at? Shot at, I'm sorry, yes. And then uh, the next one on there, um, the October 2nd? October 2nd, 2019, Gilbert AZ News. And what stood out about that? That is the same day that Brandon Boudreau was shot at. And the shooting would have occurred, did you know, do you know where the attempted shooting of Brandon occurred? In Arizona. And the last one on there? On October 22nd, 2019, wedding dresses, wedding dresses in Kauai. And what stood out about that? Uh, that date and the search for wedding dresses was approximately three days after Tammy Daybell, Tammy Daybell's death and the same day as her funeral. As part of your duties with this investigation, were you asked to look at various um, phone data? Yes. And were you asked to review the contents of phones recovered pursuant to search warrants? Yes. Were there multiple uh, search warrants and devices that you reviewed the data from? Yes. Did you also review some interviews? I did. Did you discuss uh, the investigation with other um, either special agents, detectives, or other law enforcement officers? I did. As part of that, were you asked to determine which uh, to do uh, phone number attribution. Yes. And when we talk about a phone attribution or a phone number attribution, could you explain a little bit what that means? Yes. Uh, phone attribution is the process of attempting to identify the likely primary user of a phone or a phone number, um, typically through uh, reviewing documents, uh, search warrant returns, phone extractions, and you're finding a phone number in close proximity or context with another identifier, such as a name or an account or address, something along those lines. And ultimately, that allows you to identify who you would determine to be the primary user linked to that phone number. That's correct. Um, as in preparation for your testimony today, um, did you prepare an exhibit? I did. A PowerPoint exhibit specifically? Yes. 
Your Honor, I'm going to ask that defense counsel, the witness in the court, be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 186. I would indicate, again, there is a matching jump drive for this, which uh, these are the printout slides from that, uh, power, from that jump drive. Okay. And Ms. Heidemann, if you could look through those pages. Okay. Does that appear to be an accurate depiction of the PowerPoint you created? It does. And was that prepared by you today in aid of your testimony? Uh, yes. And do you believe that it would aid you in your testimony today? I do. Your Honor, I'd ask for the admission of State's Exhibit 186. Any objection? Your Honor, I've previously reviewed 186 over the weekend. I have no objection to this. All right. Exhibit 186 is admitted. And, Your Honor, I would ask permission to publish. You may publish the PowerPoint. And again, just for the record, does this appear to be the first slide in the PowerPoint you created? Yes. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Your Honor, I apologize. For some reason, it will not go into the slideshow format on mine. We're going to hook into a different laptop and see if that will correct it. All right. We're fine. Oh, no, not that one. And, Your Honor, in the meantime, um, if I can have the court handed States Exhibit 184A, it's the jump drive that was previously admitted.
All right. Thank you for your patience. I think we have it running on this one now. So looking at this, uh, this is the second page or the second slide. Um, there's three individuals listed here. Uh, why are these three individuals listed? Uh, we identified these three individuals as the primary sub subjects in this investigation. And are there specific dates that you were focused on? Again, back to the October 2018 timeframe through January 2020. And the first individual on there listed is Chad Daybell. How many phone numbers did you ultimately attribute to him? Uh, approximately nine during this time frame. And of those nine, did you narrow that down? I did, two, and, three. Okay. And with Lori Vallow, how many phone numbers were attributed to her? Uh, approximately six. Did you also narrow that number down? I did. And how many was that narrowed to? Three. And same thing with Alex Cox, how many phone numbers were attributed to him? Uh, approximately six. And did you ultimately narrow that down? Yes. And when we talk about narrowing it down, uh, how did you determine for each of them that there were three phones that you focused in on or three numbers? Uh, for the purpose of this investigation, uh, there is a lot of information contained in text message content through the iClouds and also geolocation data. Um, they primarily focused on three numbers, um, actually for each of them during this relevant time frame. So to minimize some of the noise of all of the phone numbers that we identified, the ones being presented today are the ones that are going to be the most frequent, which you're going to hear from other people testifying if they haven't already um, coming forward. And if we focus in on the phones, uh, or the phone numbers, excuse me, associated with Chad Daybell first, um, looking at that first one on here, can you read that number into the record? 208-690-9374. And on there, there are nine things listed. Um, are those the nine items that uh, assisted you in attributing this number to Chad? Yes. Were there other things that also would have assisted with the attribution? Yes. On these that you focused in on, can we go through those? Yes. Can we just read them? Yes. Okay. If you'll just kind of provide either reading them or providing why you focused in on those. Okay. Uh, again, just as an overall, um, I reviewed case files from all the agencies involved and um, in reading reports and interviews and cell phone extractions and legal process, I was looking for phone numbers to, uh, that were relevant and then finding places in which they appeared next to a name or account. So the documents that um, attributed this phone number to Chad was um, the subscriber information. It was subscribed to Tammy Dayball since March 17th, 2018. This number was listed on a Hawaii rental agreement effective December 15th, 2019 um, in Chad's name. It was saved as contact Chad and Tammy Daybell's cell phone, our phone. It's the SMS number associated with Chad Daybell at Gmail. It was listed on a Citibank application in Chad's name. It was listed on the Life Map Insurance Benefit Claim Form filled out by Chad Daybell for Tammy Daybell's uh, death. It was saved as contact Bishop Shumway in the Lori for Style iCloud. It was listed on Allegiant Flight Records associated with Chad Daybell. And it was saved as contact Dad in Seth Daybell's phone. And do you know Seth Daybell's relationship with Chad Daybell? Uh, it's his son. And Tammy Daybell was Chad's wife? Correct. And then we see here a Cricket account. Um, what was it about the Cricket account that caught your attention? Uh, one of the frequent, one of the numbers that appears pretty frequently in um, the iCloud accounts with communications to Lori uh, was a number that started with 505 or 515, which should be coming up. But we did, we, we sent legal process and found that there are actually four numbers on this account in addition to the one number. Um, well, two numbers of interest. So all four of them sort of help uh, create attribution for each other. And on this, you've uh, it lists a subscriber, um, Boyd Dial. Is that correct? Yes. Do you know if there was any investigation done to determine if a Boyd Dial actually existed? There was. And what did that consist of? 
Uh, I was able to identify two boy dials in the United States, both of which lived in Utah and did not have any historical addresses in Arizona. Are you aware if any follow-up was done with those two individuals? Yes, uh, FBI agents interviewed both individuals and cleared them of any association with this case. And as you went through your investigation and looking at the um, different data and interviews, did you find anything to attribute any of the phone numbers on that Cricket account to either Boyd Dial? No. And looking uh, at this number, could you read that number into the record? 480-395-5126. And outside of being associated with the Cricket account, uh, was there something about this number that caught your attention? It was saved in the Lori for Style iCloud along with Chad's um, known number, the 280 number, as the same contact, Melanie 2. That sort of helps to attribute them to each other. And, um, and that was the 208 number associated with him? Correct, the 208-690-9374 and 480-395-5126 were saved as a same contact, Melanie 2. And looking at the next number here, can you read that phone number into the record? 480-812-5496. What was it about this number uh, that caught your attention? Um, two things. One, uh, the activation date for the prior number, the 480-395-5126, uh, was active from October 31st, 2018 through January 31st, 2019. The secondary number that ends in 5496 is activated the day that the previous number um, was deactivated or expired and ran through July 1st, 2019. Additionally, it was also saved in the Lori Farr Style iCloud account as Contact Genie. And these two numbers are in white. Were these two of the three numbers that you focused in on? Uh, not so much as far as what you'll hear in the investigation, but they do provide further attribution for, for the other relevant phone numbers. And this next number, if you could read the number into the record. 515-402-0143. And this one, again, has some more things listed than the last one. Uh, could we go through what it was about this phone number that drew your attention? It was first identified by the Chandler Police Department in Lori's uh, 480-692-9562 call detail records and saved as contact Bubby in the Lolly Time iCloud account. Uh, it was active. It picked up the activation from um, July 1st, 2019, the date that the prior number, the 5496 number expired, and was active until October 8th, 2019. Uh, in the call detail records for this number, we found a call to the Valley of the Sun Mortuary on July 11th, 2019, uh, in which uh, Chad Daybell calls and leaves a, or has an interaction with the mortuary, which is re was recorded. Uh, there was a text message from Lori with the content reading CONF number 99NBQ4, which was an Allegiant Airlines flight in Chad's name. A uh, text from Lori on August 11th, 2019, birthday kisses all over. And finally, it was saved as contact Rebecca Shumway and Lori for style, I, the iCloud account. And Looking back at that 208 number, um, it was also saved, that number was saved as a Bishop Shumway. Correct. So that was the second time we'd seen the Shumway name? Correct. And then looking at this next one, if you could read that number into the record. 401-569-8260. And on this one, there's several different uh, items listed as well. Can we go through those? Uh, this number was first identified as the first contact of Alex's 334 phone number. Uh, the activation period for, this, for the 401 number picks up from when the 515 was uh, deactivated or expired and ran through December 30th, 2019. Chad conducted a Google search, as previously mentioned, for Rhode Island area code on October 8th, 2019, the same date that this phone was uh, purchased. There is a text from 
Chad's known number, 208-690-9374, to Lori on October 9th, 2019, saying, I will call right now from a 401 number. Uh, this number is only in contact with Lori's 480-489-4652 and Alex's 334-744-4205 phone numbers. And it is saved as contact Bishop Miller and Lori for Style at iCloud. And through these different ways, you were able to attribute all of these phone numbers to Chad Daybell? Yes, either through um, content or uh, it's being attributed to somebody that, you know, in Lori's iCloud, there's knowledge of that, that these two people are connected. And looking back again at that first number, the 208 number, was that active for the duration of these other numbers being active? I believe it was. I don't, based on uh, the legal process, I don't know that we ever had a deactivation time. So it would have meant that Chad Daybell had uh, at least two active phones at the same time? Correct. And in looking at this next slide, um, there's two more numbers listed here. What was it about these two numbers that drew your attention? Uh, well, these don't necessarily, um, I mean, these, do, these numbers are relevant in the sense that they help further attribute Chad to additional numbers, but also Chad and Lori's aliases that are used throughout the investigation. And what are those aliases? Uh, Raphael and Lily. Uh, for Chad and Lori and James and Elena. And with both of these numbers, uh, looking at the first one there, can you read that number into the record? 602-290-7288. And what was it with this number that assisted with attributing that to Chad? Uh, between these two uh, bullet points, uh, Chad, the, the text from this number to the Daybell children, it was a group text on December 4th that began, Hi, this is Dad. And in conjunction, it's saved in Zulema's phone as contact with Raphael. So those two together would help attribute that this is Chad's phone and he's also known as Raphael to others. And the next phone number, if you could read that into the. Oh. Has saved as contact Raphael in Zulema's phone. And with that next number, if you could read it into the record. 480-341-9585. And what, uh, how were you able to attribute that phone to Chad? Uh, based on subscriber records for the James Loves Alina at iCloud.com, uh, this phone number was, uh, was listed in, in the subscriber records. This, uh, there was also a text from this number to the Daybell children on December 14th, 2019. That begins, hi, this is Chad. And it was a number being used by Chad and Lori, according to Ian Pulowski. And both of these numbers would have been in use later on in the investigation? Correct, after, uh, after the homicides, yes. And would this have been after uh, Chad and Lori had left the Idaho area? Uh, yes. Then looking at Lori and the cell phone numbers attributed to her, if you could read that first number into the record. 480-489-4652. And there are several things listed there uh, identifying this phone as being attributed to her. Did you find other things to also attribute this phone to her or this number? Uh, yes. Were these the main things that you had focused in on? Yes. And if we could just go through those. It was identified by Chandler Police Department during a review of the Lori for Style iCloud account. Um, there was no subscriber, based on uh, the, the provider records, there was actually no subscriber name uh, associated, but the account IDs were similar to Lori's known um, email accounts, which were Lolly Time at iCloud and Lori for Style at Hotmail. Additionally, the credit card information uh, associated with the provider information was uh, was was in Lori Bellow's name. 
This phone number was effective from January 31st, 2019 through December 28th, 2019. This number is also listed along with Lori Vallow's name on Allegiant flight records. It saved as contact Lori and Lily and Melanie Boudreaux Pulowski's phones. It saved as contact Lori Vallow and Zulema's phone along with an additional phone number 480-692-9562. It's listed on Delta flight records along with kkwalker75 at yahoo.com. And it was a contact number on a Hawaii wedding quote request. And looking in uh, at the Delta flight records associated with kkwalker75 at Yahoo, what was it about that uh, that drew your attention? We had identified two emails sent from this email to uh, Chad Daybell that Charles Vallow had uh, have found in the iCloud accounts and confronted Chad and Lori about being a false representation of uh, wishes he was making to have somebody write a book for him and asking for Chad to travel to, uh, I believe it was Houston, uh, for a children's camp. And looking at this next phone number, if you could read that number into the record. 480-692-9562. And again, there are several things listed here. Were there other things that attributed this phone number to Lori? There were. Were these the things that you'd focused in on the most? Yes. And if we could go through what those are. 480, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the first one was Taylor Police Department's review of Charles Vallow's cell phone uh, reviewed this as another number for Lori. So Charles had this saved in his phone. Uh, it was subscribed to Lori Vallow, effective February 4th, 2019 through January 5th, 2020. Uh, based on legal process, we found that this number was associated with the Lolly Time at iCloud, Lori for Style at iCloud, and Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com accounts. It was listed as the sh Amazon shipping contact for Charles Vallow at 565 Pioneer Road, apartment 175 in Rexburg, Idaho. It was the contact number provided on P.O. Box 415 Sugar City, Idaho application along with Lori Vallow's name. It was saved as contact Lily and Lolo and Melanie Boudreaux Pulowski's phone. And uh, similarly to the prior number, it was listed as a contact number on the Hawaii wedding quote request. And looking at that Amazon shipping, the 565 Pioneer Road, is that an address that was ever associated to Char with Charles Vallow that you're aware of? No, it was not. Was it an address that it's that he ever lived at, if you're aware? Uh, no, it was not. Is that an address that was associated with Lori Vallow? Yes. And did she live there? Yes. And looking at the next one, could you read that number into the record? 808-755-5452. And similarly, there's several things listed there. Were there other ways in which this number was attributed to Lori? Yes. Were these the main ones that you focused in on? Yes. And if you could indicate what those are. Uh, Lori provided this number to Chandler Police Department during their investigation into the death of Charles Vallow. Uh, it was subscribed to Premier Financial Services effective January 8th, 2016 uh, until November 24th, 2019. It was associated with the Lori for Style iCloud account. There was an IM to a Peter Dickinson on August 8th, 2019 that stated, Hi, Peter, this is Lori Vallow. It was saved as contact Lolo Vallow in Melanie Boudreaux Pulowski's phone. It was saved as contact Lily in Melanie Boudreaux Pulowski's phone. And similarly to the other two number, it was other two numbers, it was listed as a contact on the Hawaii wedding quote request. And on those Hawaii wedding quote requests, do you know, was that filled out in conjunction with Chad and Lori's uh, request to get married? Yes. And then looking at the Premier Financial Services, what was it about that that drew your attention? That was Charles Vallow's business. I think it misstates the actual evidence. I'll sustain that objection. As to that, just the final part of that last response. As to the final part of the response there, the objection is sustained. 
Do you know what, uh, do you know if Charles Vallow was associated with a business while he was alive? Yes. And what business was that? Premier Financial Services. Then looking at the next slide, if you would read, uh, these are the numbers associated with Alex Cox. Correct. And if you could read that first number into the record. 480-351-9120. And there are six different things listed there. Were there other ways in which this number was attributed to Alex? Yes. And were these the main ones that you focused in on? Yes. If you could please go through those. Uh, again, this was the contact number provided by Alex to Chandler Police Department and during the investigation into the Charles, Val Charles Vallow homicide. It was actually subscribed to Alex Cox um, with an effective date of February 27th, uh, 2015 until an unknown date uh, based on the legal process only went up to a certain date. So I'm not sure where, when it ended exactly. It was associated with email accounts, homerjmaximus at gmail.com and homerjmaximus at yahoo.com. It was saved as contact Alex Cox in the lolly time at iCloud.com account and as Alex Cox in the Lori for Style iCloud.com account. And it was listed on Allegiant Flight Records, which also included Harmer J. Maximus at Yahoo.com. And looking at this next phone number, if you could read that into the record. 304-960-5998. And there are not as many things listed on this one. Were there other ways in which you attributed this phone to Alex Cox? Uh, there was not much on this phone. There are other ways, but uh, through location services, but I cannot testify to that. So based on what you could review, uh, if you could go through what led you to attribute this phone to Alex Cox? It was identified through the phone's IMEI as being associated with the Homer J. Maximus at gmail.com uh, subscriber records or access records. Uh, there was no subscriber name associated with this number, uh, but there was an account ID uh, of raymaximus at gmail.com, and it was effective from September 27, 2019 through December 28, 2019. And on this next one, if you could read the number into the record. 334-744-4205. Were there other ways in which, outside of what's listed here, were there other ways in which this number was attributed to Alex Cox? Uh, yes. Uh, were these the main ones that you focused in on? That I focused in on, yes. And if you could indicate what those are. It was, this phone number was associated with a Samsung Galaxy phone recovered from Alex's Rexburg apartment. Uh, there, again, there was no subscriber name. Um, as indicated by the provider. However, there was an account ID of raylamar at gmail.com. It was effective from October 9th, 2019 through January 9th, 2020. And it was saved as contact Spencer's wife in the Lori for Style at iCloud.com account. And again, when you're attributing a phone number to someone, what does that mean? Uh, phone numbers or phones and phone numbers can be used by multiple people, but we are trying to figure out to identify, especially when there is no subscriber information, who the likely primary user is. Um, obviously, phones can be passed around. So trying to figure out who the likely primary user is um, gives us a pretty indication, pretty good indication of um, who's making these, who's uh, making the calls and text messages primarily. And Your Honor, I would indicate there are a couple other exhibits that I intend to try to introduce with this witness. I can move forward or I didn't know if the court would like to break at this point before we get into the next uh, exhibits. If you think this is a good logical time to break, we could probably take our lunch break at this point. The next exhibit I think will take more than 10 minutes uh, to go through, uh, assuming it's admitted. And so given that, I wondered if now would make sense to break. Okay. I think we can do that. That makes sense as well. Um, so we will take the lunch recess. We'll try to get started uh, before 
1 o'clock, obviously maybe um, 12.45 to restart with more testimony, if that'll give everyone time to get lunch. All right. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. We're ready to have the jurors brought in whenever they're ready. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right. That concludes the lunch break. The court would note the jurors are all present and accounted for. Uh, the state is conducting direct examination of uh, FBI agent Heidemann. Ms. Blake, if you'd like to continue with your direct at this time, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Ms. Heidemann, as part of your responsibilities, were you also asked to look specifically for evidence of wedding planning? Yes, I was. And again, did you review phone data? Yes. Did you review data recovered from search warrants? I did. And responsive documents? Yes. Did you discuss the case with other investigators? Yes. Uh, both uh, special agents and detectives? Yes. 
Did you also read uh, reports of interviews? I did. And in preparation of your testimony today, did you create a PowerPoint exhibit? I did. And Your Honor, I'm going to ask that both the witness, the court, and the witness be handled, handed what's been marked as States Exhibit 185. Similar to the other ones, these are pages that are part of a PowerPoint, uh, but for courtesy of the court, counsel, and the witness, we printed out the pages associated with that PowerPoint. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. And if you would look through those pages you've been handed. Okay. Do those appear to be an accurate representation of the PowerPoint you created? They are. And did you, do those contain information that you learned through your part of this investigation? Yes. Would that aid in the presentation of your testimony today? It would. And is this a summary of various documents and information you obtained? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of this exhibit. Any objection from the defense? Yes, Your Honor. We believe <clears throat> that uh, pages two and three of this exhibit are uh, irrelevant and have nothing to do with this case. We believe that page four contains 404B evidence. We believe that Those are all the objections that we have. All right, let's take those individually then. There's first an objection lodged on relevance grounds for pages two and three. Would you like to address that, Ms. Blake? Yes, Your Honor. Um, and if I may ask some questions of the witness in aid of that. And before publishing them, but if you'd make reference also to make sure we're tracking the same page, all of us, meaning you and defense counsel, because there are page numbers. Um, and. I, um, the one that I'm looking at would be the one without getting into what the slide contains too much would be the two documents. Okay. Is that the one counsel's referencing yes. with regards to page two? Yes. All right. Uh, Ms. Heideman, did you review <clears throat> documents recovered from the Lori for Style at iCloud.com? I did. Were there some documents that were recovered in addition to messages and other information? Yes. And looking at page two without describing what's on it, is that one of the documents that was recovered from the Lori for Style at iCloud.com review? It was. And then similarly with page three, was that document also recovered from the Lori for Style it at was. iCloud? And it was? Yes. Your Honor, I think given the fact that these were discovered in the Lori for Style iCloud, which has already been submitted to the court, uh, that account and the documents retrieved from that and the information, I believe they're already in evidence. So with that, I'd, um, I'd ask to be able to admit it because they've already been admitted and I think we could get to the relevance argument when we start to discuss that unless the court wants me to go in more detail now. I think we need to determine before it's admitted <coughs> whether or not the relevance objection would be sustained. So. Now that I've looked at it and reviewed it, Mr. Thomas, do you have any further objection as to the relevance on those first two pages? Yes, Your Honor. I don't know who, if these were to Lori Vallow or from Lori Vallow, and I think it would be significant to know that. And I'm, again, objecting to the relevancy. I don't think it has anything to do. I don't think, well, I'm just going to, yeah. The question I have looking at them, Ms. Blake, on pages two and three, uh, I, I think given the theory of the case of the state, there is relevance here and would overrule an objection just based on relevance looking at the content. The question I would have then is whether this is, 
What is the source of this information? I mean, it, I don't know that this is actually information that was obtained and gathered by the investigator here um, directly from an account of the defendant or a co-conspirator alleged or whether or not this was actually the information that was located in this account, the iCloud account. If I made that clear or not. If I can ask some additional questions, I may be able to clear that up. So a foundational concern is what I have. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. With regard to those two documents, I believe you already indicated they were located in the Lori for Style at iCloud.com, the responsive documents for that account. Correct. Were you able to tell where they were located if they were sent to Ms. Fallow or if she sent them out? If I recall, they were just saved as documents in the account without any identifiers. But they were saved in the account of Lori for Style at iCloud.com? Correct. And Your Honor, again, I think with that, the Lori for Style at iCloud.com, those responsive documents and the data has already been admitted into evidence. So these are already in evidence. Okay, and with that explanation also, uh, I just was concerned about foundation, whether this was information that was extrinsically brought in through the investigator or whether it was actually in that account. So I'll overrule the objection as to relevance, and that satisfies my foundational concerns. So pages two and three, uh, the objections overruled. So then there was a, another objection on page I believe it's page four, and just to be clear, is that regarding the Google searches, so that we're looking at the same page? There was a 404B objection. Would you? I think that was on page up? five. Oh, on page. Oh, five. was it page five? Okay, I was looking at page four. All right. The courts reviewed the objection as it relates to page five, and references. Arizona, the court would note that uh, previously I've made a determination that 404B evidence would be allowed in this case based on a ruling made in February. The jury will be further instructed on the issue of how to consider that evidence at the time of deliberations. So for that uh, reason, the objection as to the 404B lodged as to page 5 is overruled, and that page can also be uh, admitted as part of the exhibit. Thank you, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, um, Exhibit 185 is admitted then? So with that, yes, then Exhibit 185 is admitted. And I would uh, request permission to publish the PowerPoint presentation. Again, I have a jump drive that has been marked States Exhibit 185 that will be submitted to the court. Okay, so the exhibit will actually be the PowerPoint file that's located on that jump drive. The court has a courtesy copy, and with that, you can publish from the PowerPoint, Ms. Blake. Ms. Heideman, if we look at this slide here, uh, can you explain, um, or can you tell me what two documents were located in the Lori for Style iCloud that drew your attention? Uh, two documents, one titled Seven Archangels and the second one Presiding Council of Archangels. And in looking at this first document, the Seven Archangels, what was it about this document that drew your attention? Uh, initially what drew my attention are the references to Raphael and James, or James the Just, uh, which we saw Chad refer to himself frequently by those aliases. And was there anything else that caught your attention? Um, to the presence of the day Tuesday, as well as a crystal affinity of Malachite. And we've talked a little bit about Malachite before. What was it about Tuesday that drew your attention? Uh, Tuesday in relation to Raphael and James or Chad um, stood out because Chad and Lori ended up getting married on a Tuesday. And if we turn to that second document, um, the Presiding Council of Archangels, what was it about that document that stood out? Uh, it, c it contained very similar names, James and Raphael, along with uh, new names, Elena and Lily, and then the combination of both together. And what was the significance of Elena and Lily? 
Those names appeared uh, in context with Lori and text messages and uh, I believe emails in the iCloud account. And then when we look at the Raphael and Lily together, what did you notice? Similarities with the date of Tuesday and the color of green. And looking at this uh, next slide, and we had previously talked about some Google searches for Malachite, correct? Yes. And those began, when did you locate the first searches for Malachite? I believe Chad's first search for Malachite was in March of 2018 and then not again until May of 2019 when it appears in Chad and Lori's Google search history. And in the Google searches that are up right now, do you know who had Googled those? Uh, well, they appear in the chad.dable at gmail.com search history. So they were Googled from that account at least? Correct. And what about this uh, next one that appears? That appeared in the Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com search history. And what date was that searched? Uh, that would have been, I'm trying to, May 7th, 2019. And it has a timestamp there. Do you know what time that is in? Uh, that's an UTC time. So it may need to be adjusted depending on the location of the user? Correct. Uh, did you discover attempts to purchase some wedding rings? I did. And when was the first attempt that you located? The first attempt I located was on August 14th of 2019, in which Lori purchased two glow-in-the-dark malachite inlay titanium rings from an Etsy site and provided a shipping address to 5531 South Four Peaks Place in Chandler, Arizona. And that address that appears in there, that 5531 South Four Peaks Place, do you know who that address was associated with? With Lori Ballow. And before we talked about some searches done in May of 2019, do you know, was Charles Ballow alive at that time? For the searches, yes. And was he, and was Tammy Daybell alive in May of 2019? Yes. And then on this August 14th date, do you know if Charles Vallow was still alive? He was not. What about Tammy Daybell? She was. And we talked about the UTC time zone. Do you know uh, where that time zone would be? Uh, it's kind of a, just a standard, like a zero time frame. And then it's adjusted depending on your location to the different time zones? Correct, yes. And then did you find another attempt to purchase wedding rings? Uh, yes. And when was that? On August 25th, 2019, uh, Lori attempted to purchase two custom titanium rings with malachite stone inlays in size 4.25 and 11.5 from Revolution Jewelry Designs with an express insured shipping to 565 Pioneer Road, apartment 175 in Rexburg, Idaho. And did that transaction go through? Uh, no, that, that transaction, uh, the card was declined and the order was canceled. And when we talk about that 565 Pioneer Road, number 175, do you know who that address was associated with? With Lori Vallow. Did you learn whether or not uh, there was ever a successful purchase of wedding rings? There were. And do you know when that was? on October 2nd, 2019. And um, on this we see a purchase for two different rings. Did you focus in on one of these rings? Oh, we did on the second ring purchase. And why did you end up focusing in on that one? Uh, when we put the description of that ring into Amazon, that was the image that appeared, which also appears in their wedding photos. It's, it's the ring is similar in style to the their wedding photos. And when you talk about similar in style to the wedding photos, specifically, uh, was it Chad or Lori that the ring appeared to match? Lori's. And do you know what Amazon account this was purchased through? Uh, Charles Vallow's. Was Charles Vallow still alive on October 2nd of 2019? He was not.
Was there another ring purchased that day? Uh, yes, there was. And do you know where that was purchased from? Uh, that was purchased through Roy Rose Jewelry, on, on the, uh, again, through the Charles Vallow's Amazon account. And what, did this appear to be a man or a woman's ring? Uh, based on the size, uh, it was more than likely a man's ring. And what size was ordered initially? 11.5. Did you notice another transaction in regard to that ring? Uh, yes, that initial ring was returned and eventually repurchased as a size 11. Do you know approximately when that occurred? On October 4th, 2019. Do you know the date that Tammy Daybell was pronounced dead? Uh, she was pronounced dead on October 19th, 2019. Was there an additional transaction with regard to that ring that occurred after Tammy was dead? Yes, the size 11 ring was returned again and repurchased as a size 10, uh, but that one what we believe was kept. There is no, you located no evidence that that size 10 was returned? Correct. Did you notice anything else about this specific ring? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. When looking at the photo on Amazon, did oh, you notice anything with regard to that? Uh, yes, uh, similarly to the prior ring, when we uh, input the Thor Thorsten Mahai Malachite Stone Inlay into Amazon, the image that resulted is the image purchased there, which uh, again appeared to be similar to Chad's ring in their wedding photos. And is this the wedding photo that you were referencing? It is. And so when you looked at this photo, uh, you compared it to those rings to determine that they appeared similar? Correct. Did you also look at some uh, a text message that had been sent? I did. And uh, looking at the slide, is that one of the text messages that you'd focused in on? Yes. And I say text, but it says SMS message. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, could you determine most likely who that message was sent from and to whom? Again, based on phone attribution, we believe the 515 Bobby number to be uh, attributed to Chad. And who would the message have been sent to most likely? Uh, it would, this was in the Lori or the Lolly Time account, so to Lori Fellow. And what was the date of that message? Uh, July thirteenth, twenty nineteen. Did anything stick out to you about that date? This would have been two days after the death of Charles Fellow. And could you read into the record the content of that text or that SMS message? Concerning the two weeks, BYU-Idaho's graduation is July 23rd. Adam is getting his bachelor's, and Leah and Joe are getting their associates. They are all walking in the same commencement ceremony. I feel she will be gone by then, but I will still have the hoop, that hoopla to deal with because a lot of my and Adam's family are coming and will stay for July 24th. So I believe that's why the Lord hinted I might not get to be with you until that is over. Please ask about that. The individuals mentioned in that message, do you know who they are? Yes, Adam and Joe are Chad Daybell's son, sons-in-law, and Leah is his daughter. And there's some um, writing there at the bottom of the screen. Were those things that stood out to you about the text? Yes. Did you also review some texts between Chad and Lori um, from July 22nd of 2019? I did. And on this slide, uh, you have regarding quiet and the plan. When you're referencing the plan, was this in relation to a specific plan? It appears to, with the totality of everything, to be the plan to uh, be in Hawaii together. And to ultimately be together? Correct. And in looking at that text exchange, could you indicate who the text originates from and to whom, or who we believe that it originates from and to whom, and the content of the message? Yes. Similarly to the prior text, uh, it, it, the iCloud shows that it originated, or it, in this situation, a to-from situation from the 515 Bubby number, 
uh, previously attributed to Chad to Lori. And what is the content of that first message? Love you, going with Garth in an hour to see other side of heaven too. Missing you desperately, but so excited to be with you. And is there a response from Lori? Yes, Lori responded, you will love it. And then the next message? Uh, the 515 Bubby number responds, not as much as I love you. And does Lori respond to that? She does. Uh, she says, I love you. You will enjoy the scenery. It looks like Kauai a lot. And is there another message then from Lori? Hopefully we will be there someday soon together. And what is uh, the number associated with Chad's response? That is the plan and my greatest desire. Did you then locate anything regarding um, Lori requesting a quote for a wedding? I did. And when was that quote requested? On October 30th, 2019. And where were they requesting to hold the wedding? Or was she? On uh, at the Kauai Beach in Hawaii. Did she specify a specific day in her request that they were wanting to get married? November 5th, 2019. Do you know if Chad and Lori were actually married? They were. And what day did they get married? Tuesday, November 5th, 2019. And do you know if they exchanged rings? They did. What type of rings did they exchange? Uh, they appear to be Malachi rings. Judge, I have that uh, jump drive, States Exhibit 185. All right, we'll have that admitted into evidence. Your Honor, I also have what's been marked as States Exhibit 230. Uh, these are records, business records that contain a certification. I have a copy for counsel, uh, the court, and um, the witness and a courtesy copy for your honor as well if right. we can show it to defense counsel it's my understanding this was already stipulated to with having the business record certification all right we'll take a moment and review those And Ms. Heidemann, it looks like you're looking through those, but if you can just review those as well. Your Honor, again, the state would move for those admissions, the admission of that exhibit based on stipulation. Any objection as to admitting exhibit 230? Well, I'm just going to object to <clears throat> the completeness of it. This is not uh, this is not a complete record of what was sent or that what was received in this in this uh, search warrant or subpoena. All right, response to that, Ms. Blake. Your Honor, if I may have just a moment. Yes. Judge, if we could maybe approach for a brief sidebar. Yes. On the sidebar, Ms. Blake, I understand there are some additional records that would be included with this particular exhibit, and the state's going to retrieve those at this time. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. All right. Well, we talked about that. I think it would be efficient for us to uh, just keep, well, to, to do that at this time in lieu of trying to bring it back later at another point. So 
uh, for that reason, then uh, the state indicates it's not going to take very long to do that, but it will take a few moments. So we'll take a brief recess at this time until those records have been located and provided, and then we'll come back on the record for additional direct. So we'll take a recess now for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, please. Thank you. We'll have the jurors brought in. You can just remain standing. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record. Case CR 2221-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Fallow. We just took a recess to sort out a particular exhibit. Uh, it appears that the additional pages have been submitted at this time. Ms. Blake, if you want to continue with offering that exhibit, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. And for the record, uh, counsel was right. There were some missing parts to that exhibit. Those have been located and attached at this point. I had them attached to both the court's courtesy copy, the official copy, as well as have attached one to the exhibit for the witness, and defense counsel has provided those additional pages. So with those additional pages being attached to that exhibit, we would move for the admission of State's Exhibit 230. Okay, any objection now to admission of Exhibit 230? No, Your Honor. All right, Exhibit 230 will be admitted. Ms. Heideman, did you have a chance to look at Exhibit 230? I did. Do you recognize that as some documents that you had been asked to review as part of your role in this investigation? Yes. In reviewing those, did you end up putting together a PowerPoint presentation regarding what you observed in those records? I did. And is it something that you believe would aid you today in your testimony? Yes. And, Your Honor, I have what's been marked as State's Exhibit 185A. I have a copy for counsel. Uh, the, I just made three copies, but counsel, the court, and then if the witness can be shown one. Yes. And, again, similar to the last exhibits, this is a printout of a PowerPoint presentation that is on a separate jump drive, also marked as State's Exhibit 185A. All right, thanks for that explanation. And is that, in fact, a copy of the PowerPoint that was prepared by you? It is. And is it a summary of the documents that you reviewed? It is. Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of State's Exhibit 185A. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor, and uh, this particular objection, I think, 
either we should do a sidebar or we should do it outside the presence of the jury. All right, let's uh, discuss with the sidebar first and see where we go from there. All right, after sidebar, we'll be back on the record. The court had a discussion with counsel about this objection. Mr. Thomas, uh, I've approved, if you, I think it would be appropriate if you want to indicate your concern with this particular exhibit and make your objection in the presence of the jury, you may do so. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the objection that we have is that uh, the state is presum presuming that Tyler Ryan was killed on September the 8th or 9th and that J.J. Vallow was presumably killed on September 22nd or 23rd and that Tammy Daybell was killed on October 18th or 19th. Uh, we're objecting that uh, to the reference of them saying that they've been killed. We don't believe that it's appropriate to uh, have the jury assume uh, these things, that these things need to be proved out, and we don't believe that they've been proved out uh, as of yet. All right. And in lieu of uh, response at this time, I'll just note we did discuss this in a sidebar. The court considered that objection, and the way I'll rule on the objection is um, in terms of the admission of Exhibit 185A, I'll allow for it to be admitted, but clarifying that this is a demonstrative exhibit because certain uh, indications in the exhibit that may be stated as fact have yet to be or have not been conclusively potentially proved at this point. So I think it's uh, something that can be argued on both cross-examination and in your direct, Ms. Blake, but because of those dates there as they relate to the deaths, the court will admit that with a uh, limiting instruction that this would be a demonstrative exhibit and not evidence of those facts as it's existing on this on this uh, timeline. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Given that, the state would ask to publish Exhibit 185A. You may publish it. And with um, this, is this in fact the exhibit that you prepared? It is. Were you asked specifically to look at dates that Chad and Lori visited the temple together? Yes. And were you also asked to specifically look at dates they visited the temple together prior to being married? I was. In looking at this chart, were there specific dates that you located where they had in fact attended a temple together? Yes. And looking at those, can you indicate the dates that they attended temples together? Uh, November 16th of 2018, they attended the Gilbert Temple together. On April 3rd, 2019, they attended the Idaho Falls Temple together. On April 27th, 2019, they attended the Houston Temple together. On September 7th, 2019, they attended the Idaho Falls Temple together. On September 17th, 2019, uh, they attended the Rexburg Temple together, although that one had a more significant time difference than previous and, and subsequent visits. On September 28th, 2019, they attended the Rexburg Temple together, and on October 29th, 2019, they attended the Rexburg Temple together. And when you talk about that September 17th visit and the time difference, what are you referencing there? Uh, the temple records show when a member, um, I believe, scans a card and it tracks the date and time uh, to, to the second. And all the other, the previous and post uh, September 17th, they're all within a minute, two minutes, and sometimes seconds of each other, which is why we're saying that they're attending together. Uh, the September 20, the se September 17th, 2019, there was a 25 minute time difference. Uh, so I just wanted to caveat that to make it clear. And it was a 25 minute difference from when between Chad or Lori uh, scanning their card in? Correct. And the other <coughs> visits they scanned much closer in time together? Within seconds to two minutes probably on average. And looking at those first three dates, mm -hmm. Was Charles still alive at that time? He was. And do you know when Charles was killed? On July 11th, 2019. And then looking at those next three dates in September, do you know if Tammy was still alive during that time? She was. And for that first visit on September 7th, do you know if Tylee was still alive? 
She was. And was JJ still alive? He was. And there's a note there indicating on September 8th or 9th, Tylee Ryan was killed. Uh, do you know the last time Tylee Ryan was seen alive? Uh, yes, she was the last, our last proof of life of Tylee was on September 8th, 2019, uh, based on photographs of her at, uh, in Yellowstone, found on one of Lori's iCloud accounts. So is that the presumptive date um, that, uh, regarding when she was maybe killed? Correct. I don't know the exact date or time. And uh, September 17th, was JJ still alive at that time? He was. Do you know the last time JJ was seen alive? Um, well, we know that there is a photo, a photograph of JJ saved in one of the Lori, one of Lori's iCloud accounts, uh, the morning of September 22nd. And so, when we have uh, September 22nd to 23rd, JJ Vallow killed. Is that the presumptive date? Correct. And you would gather this information and then turn it over to other investigators. Is that correct? Yes. Then there are, um, and then there is also the indication there of Tammy uh, being killed on October 18th or 19th. Do you know when she was pronounced dead? October 19th, 2019. And there are two things there in yellow regarding some attempted shootings. Um, did you learn that information through your investigation? I did. And so we have the October 2nd Brandon Boudreaux shooting. That was learned through the investigation? It was. And the October 9th attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell? Yes. And so while these events were occurring, um, there were temple visits in between. Is that correct? Yeah, there appeared to be, yes. If I may have just one moment, Your Honor. You may. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Flake. Mr. Thomas, cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Agent Heideman. Is it agent or special agent or? A, uh, tactical what? specialist. I'm not. I'm not sworn. Tactical specialist. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I know. It's a, a new one I've never heard before. Okay. Uh, and so, tactical specialist. Basically, uh, you've worked for the FBI for 15 years. Yes, sir. And you indicate that uh, you just indicated you're a tactical specialist. Before that, I believe you said you were an evidence technician. Yes, sir. What's the difference? An evidence technician in, in the FBI, we were um, charged with maintaining custody and control of, evidence, of physical evidence brought into and out of the FBI. Okay. And now your job is to analyze? You're more of an analyst? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's just start with some of these uh, exhibits that the state has brought to your attention. Search activity of interest observed in Chad Daybell at Gmail. It's 184A. Can we have the 184A, please? <clears throat> yeah, just hand it to the witness. That's fine. Thank you. So you recognize this because you're the one that that drafted this, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so the first one uh, is indic indicative of Chad Daybell at gmail.com saying, Ned Schneider, 1996, Death, Louisiana. I uh, have a different. Which, what do you have? It. It's uh, 184A, which was a two page PowerPoint. Okay. That's Are you on 184A? Yeah, 184A. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a it is a jump drive exhibit. So we've got courtesy copies in the jump drive. Can I? Uh, I wrote on mine. <laughs> so, Mr. Bailiff, there's a courtesy copy the witness can look at. If you want to publish it again, you can, Mr. Thomas, or you can just refer to the courtesy copy that's provided to the witness. All right. So let, let's just let her. Uh, I'll just I'll just talk you through it if that's okay. So we're looking at uh, Ned Schneider, 1996, Death, Louisiana, you understand? Yes. Okay. And that, you said that was significant to you? It was. And when you researched that, what did you find out about Ned Schneider in 1996? Uh, we just looked at the Google search history. Uh, that's, you mean research the, what, his, what he was searching? Right. We just, I just looked at the, the, the Google search history and in these situations. You didn't look into what it, what he was looking at. I did not. Uh, no. Hmm. Not. Is there any reason why you didn't do that? No, I suppose not. Okay. So what was so significant about Ned Schneider? Somebody told you that Ned Schneider, uh, 1996, Death, Louisiana, was something significant. Uh, the name Ned Schneider or Schneider was significant. The the death dates or location was not quite as significant. You didn't you didn't think that it was important to find out who this guy was? No. Okay. The next one, 131, 2019, Ned Schneider, Louisiana obituary, 1997. Yes. You didn't look into that either? I did not. In fact, you didn't look into any of these? Uh, other than maybe the Rhode Island area code to confirm that 401? Uh, no. So your search was very narrow. Your, your task was very narrow just to find things within these search histories, because these search histories are huge, right? Yes. And your job was to find things that might match up to things that the state could use to prosecute. Is that right? Uh, potentially, yes. Okay. So you weren't, you weren't tasked with the job of actually finding out what any of these me meant or what significance that they drew. You were just tasked with finding names. That's it, right? Uh, with finding information that had already been presented in previous reporting or, or interviews, things that had already happened in the case that we were aware of, and then they appeared also in the search history. But you didn't, you didn't dig into them any further than that. It was just a cursory search. Correct, sir. Okay. And the same thing with lollyforever at gmail.com, the next part of the exhibit? Correct, sir. Okay. You mentioned, um, let's see, where am I at? Evidence of wedding planning. Uh, this was another exhibit. This was states 185. Can we have the? And we're done with 184. I. She can take that back. All right. And again, this was a PowerPoint that was admitted as an exhibit. So I do have a courtesy copy that you can use for reference. Oh, well, thanks, Judge. Witness, if you prefer. Thank you. You recall testifying about this particular exhibit? I do. And you made this this PowerPoint up? Yes. Okay. So on page two or the second page of this, uh, it talks about two documents discovered uh, during Lori for style at iCloud.com, seven archangels and the presiding council of archangels. You you wrote that? Did I write it on the slide? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. And on the other side of the slide, you made reference to the Archangel Raphael and the fact that Tuesday was some sort of a significant day of the week. Mm -hmm. what, what was the significance of that? Uh, Chad and Lori were married on a Tuesday. 
And so you thought the fact that Chad and Lori were married on a Tuesday was a significant point because it said something about the Archangel Raphael on a Tuesday? I think the to it was mostly of interest, the totality of the names and the Malachite and Tuesday uh, all in one. I think on on each on their own, probably not, but the totality of it was, of we thought, of importance. What other things happened on a Tuesday that were of significance? Nothing that I can think of. Did the kids die on a Tuesday? I don't remember. I'd have to look at the dates. Would it be surprising if I told you they died on a Monday? Okay. Would that be surprising to you? No. Okay. Did uh, Tammy Daybell die on a Tuesday? I don't believe so. Would it be surprising if I told you she didn't? No. Okay. Um, were any of these searches that were done, were any of them done on a Tuesday? Uh, which searches, sir? Uh, any of the searches in 185, 184A, the ones that we talked about? I don't know. Didn't check? No. It wasn't that significant? Not in reference to the search sheets, no. The day of the week? Not, no. not significant? It was not. Okay. Thank you. As far as the Malachite rings, um, these weren't special order rings, were they? Uh, I don't. I, in what respect? Well, they weren't. They weren't manufactured for the purpose of this particular couple. I don't know how they manufacture them. I think I believe the first, the first attempted purchase on August fourteenth was likely a special order because. The manufacturer stated he was he did not have time to fulfill the order. So, um, but I can't speak to whether the other ones are custom made by uh, by the manufacturer or if it's a Etsy company. If it's just that individual, I don't know how custom they are. Okay, so you didn't really look into that. I did not know. Okay. So basically, we have. Two Malachite rings. You don't know if they're special order or if they were uh, they were custom made, right? I do not know that. Don't. What we do know is that they were not the right size. Correct. Apparently, right? Uh, Chad's correct. Yes. Chad's was not the right size. Correct. Okay. So what size ring does Chad wear? Uh, based on the last purchase, I would assume a ten, but I can't say for certain what size ring he wears. So you don't know what size ring he wears. I do not. All right. And what about Lori? Do you know what size ring she wears? I don't know for certain, but based on the ring purchases, I believe they were a 4.5. Okay. So you don't know what size ring Lori wears? I do not. Okay. Do you know what size ring Alex Cox wears? I do not. Do you know what size ring Zulema Pastinez wears? No. Did you research any of that? No. Again, looking at State's Exhibit 185, the evidence of the wedding planning. Um, let me just get you to the right page here. One, two. Page nine would be a text from Chad to Lori on 713. So you said you had some significance with that. Would you uh, argue with me if I told you that 713 was a Saturday? No. Was there any significance to that? No. The text message specifically says, concerning the two weeks, BYU-Idaho graduation is July 23rd. Would it surprise you if I told you that was a Tuesday? No. Was that a significant day? July 23rd, no. So the second to the last page, the request for Lori to have a beach wedding on 11-5-2019 on a Tuesday, it's kind of lost its significance a little bit, don't you think? 
I think with the totality of the previous stuff on its own, possibly, but showing the planning and their, uh, I guess, sort of belief of themselves in these different ent in these different names and the significance of Tuesday to their name and the significance of Malachite, I think totality, yes, as a standalone, not necessarily. Okay. Let's turn to the uh, to the temple records, Exhibit 230. Can we have that handed to the witness? And you can take back 185, please. The last three pages of Exhibit 230, uh, those are all of the dates and times that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell had gone to the temple. Is that correct? Uh, I don't actually have those pages, but I believe they were, yes. Well, let's get those pages. 230, uh, it should look like this. Yeah. These are the last three pages. Do you have those last three pages? I do. Uh, and those are the actual attendance records of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell for their temple attendance, is that right? Yes, sir. And do you see what day these temple records start? It appears that uh, Lori Vallow's starts on October 5th, 2018. Okay. And Chad Daybell's start on October 10th, 2018. Okay. And when's the last day that they that they have records for? For Lori's, it is November 20th, 2019. And Chad's is November 20th, 2019. Okay. And um, let's, in conjunction, I'd like you to also look at 185A. So I'd like her to have both of those at the same time, if that's okay. So 185A is a chart that you uh, that, that yeah, you made up, right? Yes. Okay. And it shows that Chad and Lori had gone to the temple at approximately the same time on looks like seven different occasions. Is that right? Yes. And that would be during the time between all these records, right? Correct. Okay. Did you research... Uh, or find out or ask uh, about anyone else who also went to any of these temple trips with Chad and Lori? Uh, no, the records I were given just were for Chad and Lori. Okay. So you don't know if they went in a group? I do not. You don't know if they went um, w with each other or by themselves? They just showed up at the same time at the temple? Uh, yes. All right. Um, and as far as Chad and Lori's temple attendance, this is but a fraction of the times that they had actually gone to the temple, right? Yes, sir. A very small fraction? Yes. So what is the significance between 
one eighty five a which is your chart that indicates when they went to the temple when these people were allegedly killed and other significant events what what is the tie-in I believe that investigators I don't say noticed a pattern but saw that some of the temple visits occurred within a really relatively short time frame to some of the homicides so the temple visit most closely to Charles Fallows death was April 27th right yes sir it's about three months away is that a significant time that's up for interpretation I suppose well I'm asking you to interpret you did the chart yeah not not as significant as some of the others now all right so you're saying basically the fact that there was a temple attendance on September 7th would be significant because Tyler Ryan was supposedly killed on September the 8th correct is that your understanding yes okay and that's what the significance was potentially potentially yes I can't I guess what I'm asking is why would you make a chart to show this evidence if you don't believe in it objection your honor counsel's testifying to misstating I'll sustain that so okay another question sure so you're saying that there's some significance between Lori going to the temple and Chad going to the temple and the deaths of these people I don't know that I can testify that we're showing we're just putting it in relation in time frame relation what they did at the temple or spoke about I can't speak to I can speak to the records that we that I was presented and how they interact with the timeline of the investigation and the way that you're portraying that is in a specific way of trying to show that these events and these temple visits were somehow connected your honor objection I think this is ask and answered and again counsel's testifying that I'll overrule that and ask that the question be it was a question that I'll ask the court reporter if you would to restate that last question please with the objection overruled is that correct I don't know that I can speak to that again I'm I'm portraying records and timelines I can't say what the purpose of their visits were so that's a no objection your honor and counsel's that was a question well counsel it's argumentative it is argumentative so that's sustained let's move to exhibit number 186 and I'm done with 185 a and whichever other one she has up there on 186 you indicate that each Chad Lori and Alex are attributable to having three phones you see you say that those are significant is that right they had more than three phones but the three they each had three during the relevant time frame that we thought were of importance all right and is it were of importance I'm sorry and is it out of the ordinary for somebody to have more than one phone number no sir in fact most people if they have a business they have a business phone and a personal phone right correct and maybe maybe an extra phone right there was a Lori Vallow's phone numbers there was a phone number associated with 808 755 5452 yes 
And you indicated on direct examination that this was subscribed to Premier Financial Services? Correct. Are you aware that Lori and Charles Vallow own that company together? I probably at some time. I don't remember that off the top of my head, no. So you didn't know that? Maybe initially, but it did not It did not come to me today. Okay. Uh, turning the page on Alex Cox's cell phone attributions, you indicated on two of the phone numbers, 304-960-5998 and 334-744-4204, that there were um, emails attached to the, or I'm sorry, not emails, yeah, gmail, gmail.com emails, attached to those and that those were only effective uh, well let's just start with the first one 304-960-5998 you indicate was a was a effective between 927 2019 and 1228 2019 is that right yes what do you mean by they were only effective during those dates that was the time frame provided by the um, provider as far as how long that phone number was uh, associated with um, this, this particular account. So how does that work? When somebody's phone number is attached to a, a, a Gmail account or, or another account? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. So. You're saying that the provider told you that rehmaximus at gmail.com was only effective between 927-2019 and 1228-2019. Oh, no, sir. The phone number 304-960-5998 was effective from September 27, 2019 through 1228-2019. Um, rehmaximus at gmail.com was another identifier on that account. And so you're saying that the phone number was only active between 927-2019 and 1228-2019? Yes, sir. Okay. That makes more sense. You talked a lot about um, some of the some of the searches that were done, and I'm trying to find that. So yeah, if I could just go back to 184A, if we could have the witness hand in that. Thank you. So if you look on the second page, the summary regarding lolly for time uh, lolly time forever at gmail um on 7 2019 talks about gerber life policy and then there's a semicolon um was that all one what, what you you put a lot of things in quotes and then there's several things attached to each one were they separate uh and distinct searches or were they all one search uh, they were separate searches, or it was a um, it was a search, and then it would be a visit. So there was a visit to a site, or it could be multiple searches. Okay, so when you say a visit to a site, that's when you type something in, you click on it, and then other things come up, pop up in the background. Correct. And they lead you to that particular site. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and. 
Can you differentiate which one was which on these uh, on this particular exhibit? Uh, on this exhibit, no. How would you be able to do that? I believe my I have a full report that shows which I will have to double check which sites were visits and which were just searches. Okay. Or where go is back that to report? Me. It's in, I don't know if it's in evidence or not. So there's no way for you to tell us today whether or not these were searches or whether they were visits. Each individual one, no, but they appeared in the search history. That's what I can testify to. They appeared in the search history on that particular day. Correct. So they could have happened any time during a 24-hour period. Correct. I didn't get into the minutes. No. Okay. So um, the next one down, 7:26, 2019. Phoenix Pet Services, Craigslist, self-service dog. You didn't research into or ask any questions about what what that was specifically about? Uh, I did not. However, my job is more to provide leads to investigators, and I know that those leads were ran out by other people, but not by myself, no. Okay. If I could have just a second, Judge. You may. We're done with this witness. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any redirect? Just briefly, Your Honor. Go ahead, Ms. Blake. Ms. Heideman, with regard to the Google searches, were you tasked with just looking at what was searched? Yes. And were you looking for information that appeared relevant to the investigation? Yes. And when you found that information, did you pass it on to other law enforcement officials? I did. And when you first began that search, had the children's bodies been located? At the time I first reviewed it, no, it was still a missing persons investigation. So specifically on that wind search, did that initially uh, appear relevant to you? Uh, no, not at first. When did that appear uh, relevant? Uh, after the children's bodies were recovered. And was that based on the location? Uh, of their of their remains yes you were asked if it would surprise you that the kids died on a Monday Correct. do you recall that question I do if I told you that September 8th was a Sunday and September 9th was a Monday would that surprise you it would not. of 2019 it would not and if I told you that September 22nd was a Sunday and September 23rd was a Monday in 2019, would that surprise you? It would not. With regard to the temple visits, were you looking for times that Chad and Lori were at the temple together? I was. You were not looking at times that they went separately? No. Was November 5th of 2019 a significant day? Yes. And what day of the week was that? A Tuesday. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. I don't see any uh, need for redirect after that or recross. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Oh, so with God. that, that will conclude the testimony of this witness. Can the witness be released from any subpoena? No, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, Ms. Heideman will be recalled later. Okay. With you being recalled then, Ms. Uh, Heideman, I'll... Uh, indicate again there is the exclusionary rule in place so you're not allowed to observe any trial testimony in this case before you testify again um, you can go ahead and be uh, escorted off the seat there with the bailiff and then once you've done that I'll ask the state to call another witness so thank you for your testimony thank you.
Your Honor, the state calls Nick Balance. Counselor, before you conduct your direct examination, I'll just ask the witness, now they've been placed under oath, have you reviewed or listened to any of the trial testimony in this case before testifying today? No, Your Honor, I have not. All right, thank you. With that in mind, then, please make sure to make verbal responses to any questions you're asked and try to avoid talking at the same time as any attorney asking you questions so we can keep a clear record of the case. With those rules in mind, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to inquire on your direct, you may. Thank you. Will you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Certainly. My name is Nicholas Balance, spelled B-A-L-L-A-N-C-E. Thank you. How are you employed? I'm a special agent with the FBI. Okay. And how long have you worked as a special agent for the FBI? Since June of 2016. And where are you assigned? So I'm assigned to the Boise, Idaho Resident Agency out of the Salt Lake City Division. Prior to being a special agent with the FBI, were you previously employed in law enforcement? I was. I served as a Deputy U.S. Marshal with the U.S. Marshal Service for approximately nine years. Are you a member of a specialized unit within the FBI? Yes, sir. I'm a certified member of the Cellular Analysis Survey Team, or CAST for short. What kind of work does CAST do? In a very broad sense, CAST takes cellular records and geolocation records and puts those onto a map so we can look at where a phone was located either historically or where a phone is located now. Okay. And have you used those techniques successfully in the past? Yes. Okay. What kind of cases have you used this technology in? So hundreds of cases to include, you know, fugitive investigations, homicide investigations, missing kids, and in general just cases where it's important to know where an individual's phone was during a specific date and time that might be of interest to an investigation. Did you do similar work when you were with the U.S. Marshals? Yes, sir, I did. How long have you been a member of CAST? Since October of 2019. And do you assist other agencies with this type of analysis? Yes. So I'll routinely assist other federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies as well as I've assisted search and rescue in the past as well. How do these investigators or other agents contact you? So as a member of CAST, I do a significant amount of teaching and outreach to different prosecutors' offices and other law enforcement agencies in the area and throughout the United States. So an individual could have met me at one of those trainings and could reach out for assistance on a case, or people can also reach out through our unit, and then our unit would assign cases to individuals that are usually in the same geographic area. And how many members does CAST have nationwide? It fluctuates, but approximately 70 to 80 nationwide. And how does one get selected to be a part of CAST? So there's an application process for anyone that has interest in being a part of the program. And so if your application is accepted, there's multiple trainings that you would go to. The first three vary between a couple of days and a week in length, and they basically start with learning how to take records and put those onto a map. The first iterations of training are very instructor-led. There's a lot of teaching points 
Whereas when you get to the third piece of that training, it's more of you're given a problem and you have to work that problem out, map out those records and then provide the solution. And then that's graded. So if you complete those three uh, pieces of training, then you would go to our four week certification process. So that includes lectures specific from the different major providers from their legal compliance people, as well as their network engineers talking about how their networks work, how their records work, as well as instruction um, in radio frequency theory from uh, university professors. And then we also get instruction on what's called drive testing, which I can speak to a little bit more later if asked, but drive testing, um, learning how that works. And then at the conclusion, we get a practical exam where we have to take a case and work it start to finish as well as traditional written exams that we have to pass. Okay. Uh, when you complete that training and those written examinations, are you considered to be certified? Yes. Okay. With regards to the Rexburg, Idaho area, how many primary companies operate cellular networks? Primarily three. It would be T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T, and then historically Sprint as well prior to them merging with T-Mobile. Okay. Uh, and do they all operate independent of one another? Yes, they do. Uh, what does that mean in terms of cell towers? So basically what that means is if you have a T-Mobile phone and you're paying your bill to T-Mobile and utilizing their network, your phone's going to utilize the T-Mobile network. And even though an AT&T tower might be very near your house, your phone would utilize that T-Mobile tower providing coverage to you, your phone. Okay. You may, we talked about cell towers. What specifically do cell towers do? So from a broad sense, if you think about, I'll speak in a lot of analogies just to kind of explain things. But if you think about your phone as being a radio that you could go get from an electronics store, and so you have two of them, and you can communicate back and forth on those two-way radios. So the problem becomes is those radios aren't powerful enough to go, you know, say, from Boise all the way to Rexburg. So that's where your cellular network comes in. So if you think about that radio or your phone, it's going to communicate with a cell tower. And so that cell, those cell towers are going to be placed throughout a particular city, throughout a particular area. And what it's going to allow it to do is that radio can then take that call or text message, whatever it is you're trying to send out, and put it onto the traditional telecommunications network through that tower. So if I were sitting here with a two-way radio, I wouldn't be able to talk to my buddy, say, in Rexburg, because it's just not going to transmit that far. But with a cell phone, I can transmit to that cellular tower, and then it can route that call to the person that I'm trying to reach that might be a great distance away. Uh, what, is, what is the range of a cell tower? So it varies. Typically, you'll see it follow the population of a particular area. So as an example, here in downtown Boise, you're going to see towers a lot closer together because they're providing coverage to a lot more cell phones just because there's a larger population here. Whereas if you get out into the more rural areas out in the counties or even over to Rexburg, you'll see that those towers will provide coverage to a much larger area away from where they're located. Um, and are cell towers responsible for providing coverage to a particular area? Yes. Generally, what the cell phone company is going to do is they're going to aim the antennas on that tower to provide coverage to a specific area. If I, use, say, use the word sector in relation to a cell tower, what does that mean? So if you think about that cell phone tower, and let's say that we're looking at it directly above it, and we're looking straight down at that cell phone tower, so typically what the provider is going to do is they're going to hang the different antenna that they're utilizing for that tower, and they're going to face them in different directions to provide that coverage. So a traditional tower is going to have three sides or three sectors. What that means is basically there's going to be sets of antenna that are facing three different directions. So whenever we talk about a sector, again, going back to an analogy, if you're looking from the top, think about that tower as a pizza, a whole pizza, you're dividing that pizza into three equal parts, and each one of those equal parts would be representative of a sector for that particular tower. Okay. And can you briefly summarize how a cell phone engages a cell tower? Sure. So your cell phone, if you have it in your pocket right now, you don't necessarily have to be talking. It's constantly taking a measurement of which towers are in the area and what that signal strength is for each particular tower and a particular sector on that tower. So. 
it's taking those measurements and it's ranking them based on the different cellular technology that it sees at any given time. So whenever you go to make a call out, your phone is going to select the strongest, clearest signal in order to allow that call to happen and communicate with a particular tower. So where that's significant is that your phone is making that decision. It's not the network. Your phone has that measurement going on in the background whenever it decides which tower and sector it's going to utilize whenever it needs to interact with the network. Okay. Do cellular companies record the activities of their customers? Yes, they do. And so typically you would see this, um, I mean, several years ago, you would get this in the mail and it would be your call detail record or CDR for short. And what you would typically see is a copy of your bill and all the activity that you had on it for that particular billing cycle. So you would see um, the date and time of particular calls that you made or received, the number associated with who you called or who called you, the duration of that call, as well as the type, whether it's a call or text message. So in that call detail record, which you typically wouldn't see if you got that in the paper version or you checked on your account online, is the column that includes the tower and sector that's utilized that would have provided the ability to make that call. Mm -hmm. um, but the comp does, do the cell cellular companies keep track and a record of which cell towers are being used? Yes, they do. Okay. What do you call... Um, those records of each customer which document the cell phone usage history. So that would be your call detail record. Okay. And what, to the extent you haven't already answered this, what, what pieces of information can typically be found in call detail records? So kind of what I mentioned earlier about your bill, you're going to see the date and time, uh, what call type it was, whether it's a call or text message, whether it was incoming or outgoing the associated number that you interacted with. Um, and then as I mentioned, on a call detail record maintained by the provider, you would also see the tower and sector that was utilized during that specific interaction with the network. Okay. Uh, do cellular providers also maintain lists of where their towers are located? They do. So specific to any given carrier, they're going to have a list that includes the latitude and longitude location of every tower that they have throughout the United States. Okay. And so how can you use uh, those records you've been talking about to determine where a phone was located? So again, if you go back to that tower list, and we have the locations that a provider gives us of where those towers and sectors are located. So we can place all of those on the map, and I give the analogy like placing a bucket on the map. And so if you're looking at, you know, mapping out the towers in Boise, you're placing a bucket at all of those latitude and longitudes. And then I can take a phone if it's utilized in Boise and utilizing those towers, and every single record that you have is going to have the specific tower and sector that was used. So then you can take each record and drop it into that bucket feasibly. So at that point, you know, if you had just say a day's worth of records, you would be able to look and see as long as there's an interaction with the network on that call detail record at specific dates and times, I can estimate a general location of where that phone would have been whenever that particular interaction occurred. And you say a general location, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so whenever I talked a little bit before about the distance that a tower would provide coverage to, what we're looking at is generally a tower provides coverage out to the next tower so that there's overlapping coverage. And whenever you go to make a call, you don't get an error. You actually make the call and it goes through. So because of that, we estimate a tower's and sector's coverage to go out approximately to the next neighboring tower closest to it. Okay. Uh, you mentioned drive testing. What is that? So drive testing is uh, a technique that is utilized in the cellular industry, and I'll compare it to looking at the weather. So whenever I'm looking at just on a map, and I've mapped out the towers in an area, and I've mapped out you know what the coverage I believe to be looked at looked like, that's based on my training and experience of knowing what networks look like, but it's a forecast just as the weatherman can take a lot of different data into his equation and figure out what he anticipates is going to happen with the weather tomorrow. Well, 
just like we all live in Idaho, we know that can change drastically. So the best way to know what the weather is going to look like would be to walk outside and see, is it raining, is it snowing, whatever it is. So the same thing with a drive test. The drive test is equipment that is taking measurements constantly of the different radio frequency that's being emitted from all the different providers. So we would drive around with that equipment in a vehicle into basically everywhere we anticipate that that tower would provide coverage to, and it's constantly taking those measurements. So once I complete that, then I can put all that onto a map and I can see the true coverage area of where a particular cell tower and sector provides coverage to versus just what my estimate would be based on looking at the network on a map. Okay. Uh, in the case of the state versus Lori Vallow, did you conduct a drive test? Yes. And when was this drive test conducted? In June of 2020. Uh, why was it conducted in June of 2020? So in June of 2020, there were significant developments in the case, and at that time, I traveled to Rexburg, Idaho, and conducted the drive test. Okay. Now, can, can the data that's uh, determined by a drive test, can that change over time? It can, and again, it varies with um, depending on the location. So for instance, you know, Boise's seen significant population growth in the past few years, so a network uh, the engineers are constantly going to be looking at particular areas that, say, for instance, they may not have needed to provide coverage to a rural farm that didn't have a neighborhood on it, but that was two years ago, and now there's been a completely new development with a bunch of houses that would need service. So you can see things like that happen. Um, typically in more rural areas, it'll there will be changes, but they are just um, not as quick, I would say. Okay, so in an area the size of Rexburg, would you expect to see significant changes uh, in the results of your drive test data in the space of a year? No. Okay. So are you able to determine where a phone was located 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by, by identifying the tower and sector it used? No, because the limitations, like I mentioned, are going to be that we can look at what a tower and sector provides coverage to, but we can't say specifically down to a one inch by one inch location of where that tower or where that phone is located within that tower and sector. Second to that, all of these um, mapping of records are going to be based on there has to be a record generated with the provider in order for me to look at a particular date and time and estimate a phone's general location. Okay. Uh, does a cell phone always select the geographically closest tower? No, and I mentioned before that it's going to select the strongest and clearest. Typically, that can be the closest tower, but you can have a lot of different obstructions, like, say, a parking structure with a lot of cement in it or, you know, a mountain in a particular area to where then the cell phone, it might be closer to that tower, but it's going to select another tower that's providing a stronger, clearer signal. Okay, but does a phone have to... Uh, to collect that data, does it have to be within the coverage area of a tower and sector? Yes. So in order for a phone to interact with a particular tower and sector, it has to be within the coverage area of that tower and sector and be able to see that radio frequency signal from the tower and sector. So based on that, regardless of the phone selecting a tower uh, closer or slightly further away, the phone's approximate area can still be estimated, correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, And you, you talked earlier about can you pinpoint the exact location of a phone with cellular records? No, and it's really based on the specific records that we're looking at of how close we can determine a phone's general area. Okay. Do, you, you, do you regularly use cellular telephone technology in your work? Yes, on a daily basis. Uh, you stated earlier, correct, that you provide instruction in the field of historical cell site analysis? Yes, so I've taught, I believe it's six or seven iterations of our CAS basic class, which is our first class that you would go to if you were interested in the program. And then I've done numerous presentations for law enforcement prosecutors offices, um, both in the United States and in Mexico. Okay. We've been talking about cellular data from cell phones and towers. Um, does CAST use any other type of records other than that provided by cellular providers? 
Yes. So as you know now, your phones don't just are not just used to make calls and texts. There's numerous applications, communication applications, maps, um, the internet, things that go on on your phone that you can utilize. So as an example with a company like Google, so if you're utilizing services from Google, you have a Google account, you can opt in to have your location information stored historically by Google. So typically that's just part of the user experience where you can see locations that you've been in the past and it's really just dependent on the user if they want to opt in for that. So if a user does opt in, then Google stores that location history in a format that we can utilize to also put onto a map and see where a specific device that was reporting to Google, an estimate of where that device would have been at a specific date and time. Okay, and what other types of location information can be stored in those records? For example, with Google. So with Google, it's basically they're gonna store the latitude, longitude, the device associated with that particular record, um, the date and time of the particular record, the margin of error or how accurate they believe that specific location to be with that data point, um, and then as well how they source that. So typically with Google, there's three types of data that they would source in order to get that location information. GPS, which is looking at satellites and is usually their most precise method of determining a location. Wi-Fi, which doesn't necessarily mean that you connect it to a particular Wi-Fi, but it could be that, let's say I'm walking down the street and my phone is constantly looking for Wi-Fi, just like it's constantly looking for the different towers and sectors that would provide service to it. <coughs> so my phone might see Starbucks, might see McDonald's, but I don't connect to it. But because my phone sees it and Google knows an estimate of where that Wi-Fi emitter is and how close you have to be in order to see that Wi-Fi, they can then estimate a location of where they believe that phone is at that particular date and time. Then the third and final way would be cellular, which we're looking at those records from the provider. So typically the cellular records have a large margin of error. They can be helpful for estimating that a phone was in a particular state, but if we're looking at more specific locations like within a city, they're not usually as helpful just because of that larger margin of error. So you, met, uh, you mentioned latitude and longitude. Uh, is, how is that related to if I say GPS? So when you're talking about GPS, you're referring to global position system, looking at satellites that are looking down um, onto the Earth and giving estimates of the distance away that a particular device is. So when you have multiple satellites, you have multiple measurements of the distance away from those satellites, and you can get more precise location information that way. Um, but whenever we're talking about the latitude and longitude, that's not to be confused with the GPS. Google's reporting all of their location information via that latitude and longitude versus a street address. So it could be three different types. It could be based on GPS, Wi-Fi, or cellular. Okay, thank you. Uh, between GPS, Wi-Fi, and cellular, to the extent you haven't already addressed this, is there an order in which they are more and least accurate? Sure, based on what I've seen with Google Records, working it with numerous cases, we typically see the margin of error with GPS is going to be the smallest, Wi-Fi going to be the next in kind of priority of margin of error, and then cellular would usually have the most, the largest margin of error. Okay, and cellular, excuse me, separate from cellular providers, have you used location information from companies like Google or Facebook successfully in the past? Yes, I've used it successfully in cases with missing children, with fugitives, with locating suspects. Okay. Were you asked to examine records in the case of the State versus Lori Vallow? I was. Okay. Uh, do you know which records you examined? So numerous records in this case. Um, it was over 30 cellular phone records as well as um, multiple Google account records. Okay. Uh, did you re did you prepare a report that shows your analysis of these records? I did. Uh, was your report reviewed by another member of CAST? Yes. So prior to us submitting a report of looking at all these different records and putting them onto a map, 
we have another person within our unit that will do a peer review of those the report that we're um, producing. So it would remain into a, in a draft format up until that person who's doing the peer review checks over it and makes sure that all the process and methodology that I'm using is accurate. And then at that point, we would have a final product that would be submitted to whoever was requesting it in this instance, the prosecutor. Okay. Your Honor, I, I realize we took a smaller break earlier. I didn't. I just wanted to ask if the court was intending on another break or not. Let me quickly sidebar with counsel and we'll discuss that. Okay. Thanks, everyone. In lieu of a break, I think I'd suggest we go about another 30 minutes and then call it an afternoon. Is that fine with the jurors to do that in lieu of a break now? Okay. Everybody agrees. So if you want to go ahead and continue with your direct, Mr. Wood. Thank you. I'd ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 156. Uh, a disc copy was provided earlier to the court and to counsel. I, should, I say disc. I mean a USB. Do you recognize States 156? I do. Uh, what is it? So it's an envelope that I was given earlier um, that contains a USB drive, which contains a portion of my report. Okay. And have you reviewed that um, that USB and that portion of your report? Yes, I have. I. Uh, what format is it in? So it's in a PowerPoint format. Okay. Um, upon review of that, did you initial the USB disk? I did. Okay. Uh, and once you put it in that uh, envelope, did you seal the envelope? I did. Did you sign or did you initial or sign and date over the seal? Yes, I yeah. initialed and dated. Thank you. Sorry, I should have waited for your answer. Uh, and is that envelope in the same condition as when you signed and uh, dated it? Yes. Uh, the report that's contained in there, uh, you mentioned. Uh, that you created it after uh, examining multiple cellular um, records and Google records? Yes. Uh, was your report a s so when you look at the Google records, for example, uh, approximately how many pages of Google records are in the record that you had access to? So I was looking at the Excel spreadsheet, so I don't know about pages, but it was several hundred thousand lines on that Excel spreadsheet. Okay, so it's voluminous. Yes. Uh, are the cell records, are, are they, uh, how are they stored and um, like, can you give the jury size of the quantity of size of one of those records? So it depends on the particular provider. They can be stored in text format, in PDF, in an Excel format um, that's readable. And it really just depends on the amount of use of a particular provider and over how long of how lengthy they would be. Okay. Um, in your report, did you summarize uh, that data for specific dates and times? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and would that, uh, would that summary be helpful in you, uh, be helpful to you in testifying to the jury about uh, the records you found for those date and times? Yes, it would. Uh, when you looked at that USB earlier, was that a true and accurate representation uh, of the, the slides from your report? Yes, it was. Okay. Your Honor, pursuant to Rule 1006, um, I would ask that uh, States Exhibit 156 be entered into evidence. Any objection? <coughs> yes, Your Honor. Uh, lodge your objection, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Your Honor. I would object as to completeness. I understand that the State did provide us uh, with a copy of Exhibit 156, and it does have uh, specific pieces of that report. Uh, the report's not that long. I think it's only 100 and something pages. Let me see. 101 pages. I just asked the court to require the state to submit the entire report and not just the portions that they're requesting. All right, if you'll give me just a moment, I'm reviewing the rule again. 
uh, response to that, Mr. Wood? Uh, Your Honor, the, the state has picked out the slides it believes are, are most pertinent for this witness. Um, we can certainly provide the full report, but I would ask that we be able to go ahead with testimony now. And if the court deems it necessary, we can certainly provide the whole report uh, at the end of his testimony. And I'm okay with that. As long as we get the whole the whole report in, I understand he's probably not going to testify to every page in the report. He's probably only going to testify to the ones that he has uh, there. But I would like the jury to be able to review the entire report if they wish. All right. So rule 1006 does cover summaries to prove content. So to be clear then, Exhibit 156 is, in fact, a summary. It's not the entire report, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, the objection is overruled as it relates to Rule 156. Uh, Rule of Evidence 1006 does require that the originals or duplicates be available for examination. And based on the objection of the defense, uh, I would require that the uh, complete report also be provided as an exhibit at some point to correspond with Exhibit 156. Thank okay. you, Your Honor. Thank right. you. We can, we can have that uh, provided by tomorrow, Your Honor. With that, was 156 admitted? It is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask to publish to the jury. <clears throat> you can publish it. Um, Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness remove the USB from the sealed. All right. Based on the foundation laid to submit the exhibit with his testimony, I'll find on the record here that he is allowed to open the sealed envelope and remove the contents, which is a USB jump drive. Agent, can you explain what's on page 11? Uh, I'm just going to, each of these slides, for the purpose of the day, Your Honor, is, is numbered where it was in the report. I didn't renumber anything, so I'll just refer to the slides by, uh, if it's okay with the court and counsel, the number that's in the upper right-hand corner. Yes. Agent, can you describe what's on page 11? Yes. Page 11 is a part of the report that's basically showing more of a legend and showing how I'm going to be representing um, call activity whenever it's placed on a map. So I'll start from the top. The different circles, red, green, and blue, are representative of the other towers that are on the map that were not utilized during a particular interaction. Going down the left side, those are all of the different numbers that are included in this report that would be shown on the map. And then whenever I talked before about the sector, so as you can see, um, looking at the blue wedge per se, there's kind of a half circle on there. That doesn't mean that a phone was located within that shaded in area. That's merely just to show the direction from the tower that that particular interaction took place, like where from the tower the phone was generally located at the time of that interaction. So as you go down, you'll see there's multiple different numbers. Um, and then it has a name associated beside the number that was provided to me. On the call information box, you'll see every time there's a particular um, interaction that's mapped out, you'll see these boxes and that's what they represent. So the cell ID is the tower information that lets me know where on the tower list to go to find out where that tower and sector is located in the direction that it's facing. And then you'll see the date and time, the target number specifically that I'm mapping. So I'm pulling records associated with that number from the provider. The start time of a particular interaction, what the type or the direction that it was being outgoing or ingoing. 
duration or how long that particular interaction lasted, the type of a call, typically what you'll see here is voice or text, and then the associated number. So on an outbound call, the associated number would be the number that was called. On an inbound call, the associate number would have called the target number. Okay, when you talk about duration, what's that measurement? Is that? That measurement is in seconds. Okay, all right. Thank you. Can you explain, you spoke earlier about drive test data. Uh, can you explain these graphics to the jury? Yeah, so this is basically taking what I said and showing the visual representation of that. So you'll see drive test data represented usually one of two different ways. <coughs> the first way on the left is where you're looking at that darker green area. That's the dominant coverage of a particular tower and sector. So what that means is if a phone is within that dominant area, it's going to prioritize that tower and sector of what it wants to utilize to communicate with the network. The lighter green area is the coverage area. So what that means is if a phone is within that lighter green area, then it could interact with that tower and sector. It has the necessary coverage for it to interact with it. So then on the right side, you're looking at two different towers. So the tower on the top right, which is again represented by that wedge shape, and then the tower on the bottom left. So I'm putting the coverage of two different towers and sectors on a map. And so what you'll see is that orange area, that those are areas where you have overlapping coverage, meaning that a phone can see both tower and sectors and could utilize either one. So in contrast, if a phone is up closer towards St. Anthony in the red, and it doesn't have that overlapping coverage, it doesn't see that tower to the southwest, so it wouldn't be able to interact with the network on that tower and sector. Can you explain what's on slide 13? So just like we looked at with the cellular mapping, this is looking at how I'm going to map Google location data. So starting on the left side, you'll see three different icons. So what that represents is Wi-Fi, I'm sorry, two different icons, Wi-Fi and GPS. So as a part of mapping with this case, anything that was greater than 100 meters margin of error, I didn't map for these particular reports. So because of that, there was no cellular data that was 100 meters or less margin of error. So that's why there's not a cellular icon up there. Below that, you'll see the yellow circle. Basically, that's how I'm going to represent the margin of error. So the center point of a particular GPS or Wi-Fi location and then the margin of error, say it's 30 meters. So from the center of that yellow circle, the radius of 30 meters going out from the center point, that's how that's represented. represented. So that yellow circle would be representative of the margin of error. Um, looking at the call-out box similar to the phone uh, previously, what you're looking at is the date and time, the device tag, and that's basically going to associate it with a particular phone that is connected to the Google account, the latitude and longitude, and then the margin of error is going to be that R and then the number following it. So you see there R14, that means there's a 14 meter margin of error associated with that particular data line. And then at the bottom, with Google, we can see a lot of data points in a short amount of time. So in order to put those on a map, it can get extremely cluttered. So typically what I would do is if I had, say, you know, 25 different <laughs> locations on a particular map, I would put a summary box. And what that's going to do is tell you what types of records I'm summarizing there at the source, whether it's Wi-Fi, cell, or GPS, and then the number of records and the margin of error associated with them. So for instance, if you were to see Wi-Fi 26, that means there's 26 Wi-Fi records that I'm representing on that particular page, and then that the margin of error is 17 to 135 meters for those. Can you explain what's on page 14? These are all addresses that were provided to me that were of significance to the investigation. So when you see them on the map, you're going to see them um, basically with the icon associated with that particular location. Okay. Is that the same thing on page 15? It is the same, and I'll make a secondary note too, because there's a note at the bottom um, of the previous page that you just showed. Basically what that indicates is that if there are locations that are very close in proximity, to put them both on a map, you might see one icon overlap the other. So because of that, I just made a note that I'm only going to put the specific uh, 
icon associated with one of them, but there could technically be two, which I'll make mention of later if that becomes relevant. Agent, before we continue, we've been talking about location data. And when we're talking about the location, what specific item are we talking about the location of? When you're talking about these icons? No. You know, Sorry. let me rephrase my question. That was confusing. I apologize. I want to talk about some of the limitations of, of what we're going to be looking at. Are you able to place a phone in a specific person's pocket? No. Okay. Uh, so you're able to look at records of who you believe a phone is attributed, attributable to, correct? That's correct. Uh, but you don't specifically put it in their pocket? No, and that's a common theme, I think, that's said a lot. You know, whenever we're doing these records, I'm looking at the location of the phone. I'm not looking at the location of a person. Evidence might indicate later to us that a particular phone was in a particular person's hands, but whenever I'm doing this mapping, I'm mapping the location of a phone, not a person. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go over some of the events and some of the things you found on September 9th of 2019. Uh, can you tell the jury what you see on and and what you mapped out on page 19? So this was looking at the Google location history associated with a Google account of homerjmaximus at gmail.com. So the way that Google identifies an account, just like your cellular carrier is going to identify your account based in part on your phone number, Google can, is primarily going to identify account by that gmail.com address. Do you... Do you know who Homer J. Maximus at gmail.com, do you know who that uh, email account belonged to? I reviewed Google the account? subscription sheet associated with the Gmail account, and it came back to Alex Cox. Okay, thank you. If you can continue to explain what's on page 19. So you'll see a trend because there's several um, pages that potentially are going to be shown, and just so you're familiar with the structure of the report. At the top, what you're typically going to see is what I'm mapping, whether that be an interaction with a cellular network or Google location. So that's kind of the Google location history that's explaining what it's going to be. Below that, you're typically going to see the account, whether it's an account or a specific phone number that we're looking at, and then the time range that a particular map is providing an overview of. So specifically, this is looking at September the 9th, 2019, from midnight until 5 a.m. So again, when I talked about the mapping for Google location history, I did not map anything that was greater than 100 meters. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at three locations that were repeated on all three occasions at 2.42 and 2 seconds, 2.42 and 11 seconds, and then 3.37 and 22 seconds. This is Google location points based on GPS that were directly northwest of Lori Vallow's apartment. Okay. And I'm going to stop you really quick. Uh, would it be helpful uh, for you to use a pointer to show the jury specifically what it is you're talking about? Yes, it would. Thank you. So this is what I'm looking at for, sorry. That's what I just talked about first, was those three locations. And then looking at from 437 until 441, there's additional Google location points. Again, a repeat of the same points, but showing a 37 meter margin of error that would be consistent with the phone being at Alex Cox's residence. Okay, and, and I know we, we went over a legend earlier, but just uh, as we get into this to aid the jury, uh, there is an AC in the in that bigger yellow circle, correct? Correct. And so you'll see down on the bottom left, that's going to usually show the legend of the specific locations that we're looking at. Only to include the full address would again create um, cover up the map per se. So those addresses are all in the legend on the previous pages, but what you're looking at is just the icons that are represented down here in the legend. Uh, and so, Agent, in the, the upper left-hand box, uh, with that explanation, can you just briefly state again uh, what it is we're seeing in terms of that data? Yes, so you're seeing locations that reported to Google between 242 and then 337 
indicating that the device reporting to Google was just northwest of Lori Vallow's apartment. And so that would be a device that signed, that signed into this Homer J. Maximus at gmail.com? Correct. That would be a device that the user associated with that account has opted in for location data on that specific device. Okay. So on, on the night of September 9th, and I, we won't necessarily go into detail, so much detail on each slide, but just so that we're, we're tracking, on the night of September 9th, uh, that device was just northwest of Lori Val's apartment. Correct, and I would say the early morning hours. Or, so thank you. That, that semantics. Yes. But. No, you're, no, that's the more accurate way to say it. Thank you, um, Agent. Did you uh, did you ever track or find other times when a device signed into Homer J Maximus was located at Lori Vallow's apartment uh, between the hours of twelve and, and five, or in the middle of the night? I did. I looked at the time period from, um, I believe, August 1st until October 31st, and there were, um, I believe it was less than 10, but there were other times other than this specific date and time where the device reported a margin of error that was small enough to be consistent with it being at Lori Vallow's apartment. Okay, thank you. Was there anything else on this slide that was significant to you? in your investigation. I'll add one more piece just because the arrow will be recurring throughout. Anytime you see an arrow, that doesn't indicate that that's the specific pathway that a device took to travel between two points. I'm just simply showing that we have an earlier time from 2.42 to 3.37, and then there's the later time of 4.37 to 4.41. So basically just to show that arrow to indicate that the device moved that direction during that time period. Can you explain what's of significance on page 20? So this is looking at the first time that you're seeing at least cellular records mapped onto a map depicting a particular area. So again, if we start at the top, we're looking at two different numbers, the number ending 0143 and 4652 during the time period of September 9th from 720 in the morning until 804. You're seeing Chad Daybell's residence represented here in green with CD. Lori Vallow's residence represented down here. This is a good example to say too where I don't have an icon for Alex Cox's residence, but that's because if I were to place it, they're so close in proximity that they would overlap each other. And then we're looking at the location of the BYU library. So over here, again, if you wanna see which particular color is represented from the particular interaction with the network, we see that 4652 is represented in blue. And then up here we see 0143 is represented in orange. And then you're looking at the summary of the activity that took place on each one of those towers and sectors. So on the 0143 number, we see several incoming and outgoing SMS messages with 4652 utilizing this tower and sector, which would provide coverage to Chad Daybell's residence. And then we see a call that is between 0143 and 4652. Down here, we see the other side of that call where 4652 is receiving that call from 0143, utilizing a tower and sector that provides coverage down in Rexburg. Okay, and can you remind the jury that the number 515402-0143, who has that been attributed to? I had that attributed to Chad Daybell. And the other number, 480-489-4652, who has that been attributed to? I had that attributed to Lori Vallow. Okay. And so on the, the morning of September 9th, 2019, you see between 720 and 804, there were multiple communications between those devices? That's correct. Can you explain what's of significance on page 21? Yes. So what we're seeing, again, the summary at the top, I'll only mention this one more time because then it might be redundant, but we're looking at tower interactions with network with the network between 9120 and 9374 at 811 in the morning. So this is a call made by 9374, utilizing this tower and sector, which would provide coverage to Chad Daybell's residence, to contact 9120 
And this is showing the other side of that call where it's receiving it as an incoming, utilizing a tower and sector which would provide coverage to Rexburg to include Lori Vallow and Alex Cox's apartments, respectively. Okay. And again, those numbers, uh, can you can you tell the jury who they're attributable to? Yes. So I had 9120 being attributed to Alex Cox and then 9374 being attributed to Chad Daybell. So is it a fair summary to say, to say that uh, there was a 182nd or three-minute uh, uh, conversation between those two devices that on is correct. the morning of September 9th at 8-11? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yes, that is correct. That's okay. What is of significance to you on page 22? So this is looking at three different towers and sectors that are being utilized by the 0143 phone. And the different activity is shown in each of the call boxes. So this is an outgoing text to 4652. This is an incoming SMS from an unidentified number. And this is an outgoing and incoming SMS, both with 4652. So when we're looking at this, we're seeing three different towers and sectors that are being utilized within about a 40, 51 minute time frame. And, and why is, what does that mean to you as an anal analyst of these type of records? So one of the things that I talked about earlier is looking at where we estimate that a phone could be based on tower and sector usage. So anytime we see usage between towers and sectors that are a vast distance apart, what I would anticipate is that the phone, especially when you're looking at, you know, 858 and 905, that's less than seven minutes apart. So what I would anticipate based on my training and experience is that since we're utilizing towers and sectors that are vast distance apart, there's gonna be an overlapped coverage area between those two, that within that seven minute window, you couldn't feasibly drive from down here all the way up to Parker within that less than seven minute window. So the phone would need to be within that, somewhere near the overlapping coverage area. And the closer that is in time, so say for instance, you use one tower and sector and then 30 seconds later, you use a different one, you're going to be, my estimate would be, you're much closer to that overlapping coverage area. Okay, and just briefly, can you just, uh, so there's there's three uh, interaction boxes there, correct? That's correct. Um, and in that first one, again, the, the 0143 number, who is that attributable to? Chad Daybell. And the 4652 that uh, it's, that number is communicating to, communicating no. with, who is that attributable to? Lori Valla. Okay. Um, and the box on the right, can you just briefly go over what, what those interactions are and who those phones are attributable to? Yep, so it's one text message being sent by Chad Daybell 0143 and one being received by Chad Daybell 0143. Both of those interactions are with the number ending 4652, which would be attributed to Lori Vallow. Are you familiar with the, uh, there's an, on that bottom box to the left, the number uh, 2881568585. So I'm not familiar what that number is, but I would point out that it's not 10 digits. So typically you can see, like a lot of times you'll get a text message and it won't be from a true number. It might be like a service type thing um, that you receive on your phone. So again, I don't know without looking into it, but I would, just basically take notice that it's not 10 digits to be a true phone number. Uh, in light of what you were just testifying about, what's the significance of page 23? So this is where I talked about where we can represent coverage areas and overlapping coverage areas. So if you're looking the tower here, the coverage area, and it's only gonna be the coverage area, not the dominant area. That coverage area is represented by the red. The tower here, that tower and sector is represented by the green. 
And then the tower and sector on the southwest part of the map is represented by the yellow. So then what you can see is the overlapping coverage area and when it goes onto a screen, it doesn't necessarily show it as clear. But what you're looking at is that orange area is the overlapping coverage area. So what that means is that if you were to see records 30 seconds apart, utilizing all three of these different towers and sectors, I would anticipate that that phone would be somewhere close to one of these orange coverage areas because in order for it to have those interactions, it has to be within the footprint of that tower and sector. Okay. What did you map on page 25? So this is looking at, again, mapping some of the Google location history. So we're looking at 849 to 915 approximately, showing that at 849 and 19 seconds, the account associated with Homer J. Maximus at Gmail, um, which we attributed to Alex Cox, that phone is reporting to Google a location down in the area of his apartment. And then at 915 and 43 seconds, that phone is now reporting a location just south of Chad Daybell's residence. And what is the margin of error on those? So the one down here on the bottom, you can see the R8, which means eight meters margin of error, and then R3 on the one on the top, meaning three meters margin of error. Okay. And again, the arrow does not act, the arrow doesn't mean that's specifically the path followed, correct? That's correct. It's basically just representing that this preceded this locate down here preceded the one at the top. Okay, thank you. What did you map on page 26? So again, this is mapping location history for Homer J. Maximus attributed to Alex Cox for the time period of 921 and 36 seconds to 1057 and three seconds. And this is mapping any point that I saw in the Google location history that was of 100 meters or less. And so what that gave is four location records that indicated where Google believed this device was during the specific times on the called out boxes. Can you specifically point out those times and the uh, margins of error with those? Sure, so the first one that we see is at 921, which is a six meter margin of error and that's gonna be represented by this smaller circle here. I realize the other one is over top of it. The next one that we see is at 922 and 50 seconds, which is gonna be up here by a gate into the Daybell property. And that's a three meter margin of error. Then we're gonna see at 1039, this 43 larger circle margin of error which is where the Google location is indicating that the device is basically a 43 meter margin of error in the backyard. And then we see at 1057 and three seconds, a five meter margin of error, which is plotted just south of a location that I was provided for the burn pit. Okay, and can you, um, I see that you've got your legend labeled. Uh, uh, but just uh, for benefit of the jury, can you point out where each of those are? Uh, labels are located on that map? Sure, so Chad Daybell's residence is represented in green here with CD. The location of Tylee Ryan's body is here, which is represented by TY in red. And then BP is the burn pit, which is just southeast of where Tylee Ryan was located. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wood, <laughs> I think we're at about time we ought to consider breaking for the day. Okay. I don't know if that was a good breaking point or you had a few more that's, questions. That's just fine with the state. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, all right, we will call it a day then and be back in the morning at 8.30. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you again for your jury service. I will advise you as I have each day uh, upon concluding trial for the day Please make every effort to not discuss this case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Please don't do any investigation into the case while you're on the break for the night. Please don't follow any of it on the news or look it up on the internet in any way. 
and I appreciate you every day following that instruction. It's very important to the case and the parties as well as the court appreciate your continued adherence to that. So with that in mind, we will adjourn for the day and plan on starting again with further testimony at 830 in the morning. All rise, please.